Excellent. Smash that live button. <laughs> this is the very rough beginning of RX Only Picture Show number 40. And we're live. We're live. This Let's is the part where you say hi to everyone who's watching the rerun. Hi, everybody watching the rerun. <laughs> Did you see the cloned gem meme, Tracy? The what? Cloned gem? No. Oh, wow. <laughs> what was that? Jim, Jim made a meme, um, and it's got you saying, it's that you're saying, I don't know, and I'm saying, who cloned Jim? And Jim's sitting in his piano, but he's somehow, like, he's on his phone, and he's taking a drink of beer, and it's like he's, me. And he's uh, holding a microphone, and like... I believe it was a root beer. Snake Jones in the chat with the first. First is Wednesday already. Jeez. I wish it wasn't Wednesday. <laughs> Just kidding. Wednesday again. All right. Let's sit down and promote this stuff. RX Only Picture Show number forty. Audience participation. Sculpt, paint, and read with Tracy R. Twyman. Oh my god. <laughs> your easel's the same. I gotta hit this thing with your TV. Uh oh. Your easel's like, bro, bro. What do you think I am? A drum set? <laughs> What's got three legs and no place to sleep? <laughs> a drummer? <laughs> oh, the, let's see, the joke is uh, what has three legs and only an asshole? A drum throne. <laughs> a, drum, a drum throne is the fancy name for a drummer's stool that he sits on. And it has three legs, you know, like it's a metal adjustable stool. So that's a. There's a lot of uh, really. Um, good drummer jokes like how do you get um, how do you get a drummer to get the hell off of your front porch? How's that? Pay him for the pizza. Um, what do you call a uh, drummer with no girlfriend? What? Homeless. <laughs> I love drummer jokes. There's at least one more. I, I really. Uh, to, to make it even, since I'm more of a lead singer type, um, how do you know when the singer's at the front door? How's that? If he, if he can't find the key. <laughs> if he can't find the key and he doesn't know when to come in. <laughs> if you got something to say to me. I thought it was supposed to be a girl singer. I thought that's the only way that joke worked. Why is Am I wrong? No, why is that? Why Why wouldn't it not work? Because it's a joke. I, well, the, the joke that was presented to me was male musicians making fun of female musicians. Yeah, I mean, that's totally understandable. It is a double whammy if you're a girl. But believe me, as the male <laughs> singer, um, you are not by any means like given a pass if you're the singer. It's the opposite. Like, you're, you're a preening peacock and a little bitch and... It's your job to make sure everything's perfect, and if it's not, it's your fault. Because, you know, like, I always compared it to playing defensive back in football. I don't know if you know football, but, like, being the guy that has to prevent wide receivers from catching the ball is really hard. And so if you screw up, it's really obvious. And if you do a good job, it's just what you're expected to do. It's, it's being the singer is the same. Like, if you forget the lyrics or sing a big flat note or you come in at the wrong place... You, there's no, you know, if the bass player kind of screws up, it's pretty easy to hide it or to ignore it and kind of let it go. The singer and the drummer, if you make a mistake, there's, you, you're not, you don't get to like cover it up. It's not like the RX only picture show. No, well, this this whole thing is like the singer book, screwing up. <laughs> I've been trying to, to reduce the F bombs down to like less than 5%, you know. Good to go. Eleven or watching what will happen now. I gotta get promoting. Give me a break. Welcome to the show, you guys. 
Welcome to RX Only Adventure Show. It's the Adventure Channel shouting us out all week this week. We appreciate that. Here's a shout out back to the Adventure Channel. Go check out the Adventure Channel. He's got some interesting stuff to say. You could say that you got in early before he was a thousand subscribers or more. catchy now is your chance to run and grab your art supplies so that you can make art while we make art oh that's a good idea you guys i'd say you could read aloud while tracy reads aloud you could but that would probably be weird <laughs> i can't read while somebody else is reading it's just it's just really really tough What is up, Jacob Bacchus? What is up, the Adventurer Channel? Wait, is it Adventurer Channel? Adventurer Channel, yeah. That explains it. And Snake Jones, number nine. Number nine. Oh, hey, Krista. It's Jim's song. All types of toes are welcome. An American one. It's real plus ultra hours. Who up? That makes me want to go. Ooh, 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 ooh. Hey, hey. Cody Ivy says, You guys are late. I want my sound check now. <laughs> Up. I wouldn't know where I'd be at. What's up, Harrison? Ready to make some art? Listen to some uh, reading today? Possible he had something better to do. Who do you want what? To be <laughs> Where do you want Maybe he's getting one of those half degrees. What did you want to be when we up? It's like a black belt with red stripes. How much longer should I tag you see this deal? Should. You like to tell the path with my flower. Oh, 
There's been some uh, really interesting conversations going on in the Discord this week. If you're new to the show, you should, you should check out the Discord. If you don't have the link, hit us up and we'll drop one. Some of the links that people have are permanent, so you can get one of our current non-sworn oath members to invite you privately. It's sort of an oathless mystery school, as we say. What did you want to be? I think you were born to mix miniature scale Gerties. Like one fifteenth scale, one tenth scale. It's a Gertie. It's her little tiny yurt house. Oh, she builds like ice. She brainstorms ideas of miniature versions of the soul. Oh, that's a great idea. Uh, I've always wanted to make like a marble Gertie as a, as a memorial. That you could live in? A marble, a marble make it, dirty? Make it like the stone hand that you only permanent. And like have all these bronze Only a permanent soldiers. one? Yeah. That's funny. Because <laughs> Stonehenge is so fleeting. Now you know what we really think, Stonehenge. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I hate this update request. Last computer. Delta Victor W7XDV says, I'm painting. Sweet. Sweet. Well, you're a step ahead of me, Delta Victor. Oh, this is a really good song. You guys should uh, check this one out. It's called The Recent Placebo. He called me by the wrong name. What got behind she you? Reading the chat here. That would be cool. They could sit in the corner and just silently read the chat. <laughs> LOL. Ha. <laughs> ah. Ha. Ah. One that I had a premonition about. I'm gonna make this one, Tracy. Can you see? Oh yeah. Okay. I, I told. I've been. I've been thinking about this for almost a year. I told Jim that if he sculpts that, I think if we make it into bronze, that there will be high demand for it. You never know. I definitely would demand it. <laughs> All right. Say, hey, give me that. <laughs> <laughs> well, how am I going to do it? You over We're going to make yours out of pot. And you took I don't know why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, like, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> that way you're totally conflicted. Like, this is so pretty, but I so want to be baked right now. <laughs> Can you see me, Tracy? I can. Okay, now, if I step out of the way, can you see this? Uh, Not very well. It's kind of dark. It looks like the lectern in, the, in front oh, of it. This thing. Yeah. This, this is in the way, Sean. Yeah, but I think there's not enough light in this thing. 
You can turn on that blaster up there. Turn on the blaster. Oh, it's unplugged. You, uh, you can plug it back in though. I've made room. We'll call this light the Nerf Blaster. That works. Where are you going to stand now? I want to get like one of those uh, harnesses, like like the people that play Peter Pan wear in the plays, yeah. where they can fly, yeah. and then you can just like hang from the ceiling, upside down, and paint and stuff. That's the about some gravity boots. That's the real reason you were trying to get Mike to do it. Gravity boots would be sweet. Can you see that then? Yes. Yeah. This is the painting I put away probably in 2002 or 2003. It's called Ozzy Osbourne Fully Prothesalized and Fervently Preaching the Apocalypse. Okay. Nice. Okay, let's see. How do you like it? What about the uh, the object? Doesn't it have to be there. The thing that your keyboard is on. Oh, no, I was just getting ready to move that next. Oh, great. Good idea. Turns lecturing. Lecturing. Lecturer. Uh, okay. Oh, I was going to insta us to Insta two. You're going to insta two? What happened? What happened to our Adam Lore? Yeah, Adam, what are you doing, man? Don't let me down. Adam. <laughs> Don't let me down. Oh my goodness, well no wonder. That's weird. Hold on, we're going to play a couple more songs because we're not quite ready. Somebody's karaoke particle let's, target? Let's, let's bring back some old school picture show memories. Who's Starting from the beginning. Welcome to the show, folks. We are super glad to have you. We're going to play maybe one, two more of these wonderfully entertaining, addictive, and quite expensive Adam Lore songs. You can get all of these on vinyl. They're $110 each. They're uh, 45 singles, and they come with a record player. And that's a lie. <laughs> Making that up. Mm, 27 watching, that's my lucky number. 2 plus 7 equals 9. 9 is the number of completion. <laughs> we better complete some art today. That's my goal, that's why I chose this thing. Have you ever done the, uh, what's it called, Briggs Myers test, Tracy? No. What is that? It's like, well, it's based on. Jungian archetypes, most people don't know that. And what it is, is like you go answer this whole long series of questions and then it categorizes you into one of 16 different personality types. And there's really four categories, but then there's uh, four nuances to each category. Okay. But um, I'm an ENFP, for those of you listening that might be, uh, there we go, Bacchus is INTJ. That does not surprise me, Jacob. INTJ is like the uh, the wounded genius of the world. Like they're so smart and so creative at the same time, they don't even know why the hell they're here. Um, and, and INTJs and ENFPs, like, we're supposed to be like bread and butter, you know? 
Um, but uh, ENFPs, like, it's a cliche. Like, there's memes about ENFPs having lots and lots and lots and lots of unfinished projects. Oh. And it's true. Jim could testify. Well, he's an ENFP, too, so <laughs> you, you can yeah. follow us around to anywhere we go, at home, at our parents' houses, at work, at, in, in our car, and there will be unfinished projects there. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Let's see. All right. I'm going to shoot a quick video. You're going to shoot a video? Yeah. If you're on Instagram, you can see a preview of the article that you showed up before. That's the video. That's all. Hopefully you're watching some reruns and got your brain horns up. Tracy Twine is going to read for us on our own feature show number 40 this week. It's honestly so embarrassing to go back and watch the shows because I'm such a dork. I have a, a question for the audience. If there's anyone who has their favorite segment in The Secret Doctrine that they'd like me to read, you just let me know and I'll look it up. So to repeat, um, Tracy says if there's a favorite segment that someone from the chat or the audience wants read from The Secret Doctrine of the Templars, please let us know so that she can find that page and read it aloud for you this week. Urania says uh, the music is painfully loud. Is it? I'll turn it down. Thank you for giving us that heads up, and please always, if the don't hesitate to let us know if the sound is funky, y'all. So, so I'm rolling it down there. And we're almost ready to go here, so I think I'm ready. Ready? You want one more song, Jim? I'm ready. All right. Let's pause this. No. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I bet that's gonna wrinkle some wrinkle some feathers. Does that even make sense? I'm way it's off. Wrinkle here. feathers, I think. We go. What? Tracy's not in here. All right. Let's fade over. You're you're here. You're just not here. I don't know why you're not here. That's weird. You, we need to drag her in. There she is. Oh, popped up. Oh, huh. sweet. The little leprechaun Hi, who are listening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ark's Only Picture Show number 40. I am SB, this is Jim, and of course with us we have prepared to read this evening aloud while we do art. Tracy R. Twyman of, well, the author of so many books that you're just going to have to go buy them to catch up, folks. Links in the description. <laughs> I, I, would, uh, I would be careful about saying prepared to read tonight. Because <laughs> I'm... I accept that I have I have uh, scheduled that. I'm just not saying, you know, I wouldn't go around boasting that I'm prepared. <laughs> I'm Ooh. rather ill-prepared. Yeah, we could go ill-prepared to read tonight. Okay. Tracy yeah. has a license to ill-prepare. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I had some books that I had picked out and that are at the office that I was unable to get to tonight in time. So I had to pick the books that happened to be lying around which is a kind of bibliomancy if you think about it. It's we can we can tell ourselves that it was meant to be this way, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it is. It's, <laughs> it's meant to be. You didn't you didn't text us and say, "I'm not at the office. I can't do it. You guys are on your own." Then then it wouldn't be meant to be. That's right. The audience would so, see a very sad picture show that week. Yeah. You know, I mean, if we knew in advance, I figured now that there's three of us, if we know in advance, if anybody has to be absent, then the other two probably can make it, you know. But, like, if it's a last minute, like, I'm calling from the gas station 
and you guys are on your own, that's probably going to suck. It's going to really suck for Jim because he doesn't ever have to do the, like, push all the little buttons and make the show go. He knows how, but it would be, like, pressure. Like, pressure's push on. Our... Go be Sean. Hurry up. That, that's always bad news if that's your job. <laughs> So, uh, Harrison, oh, never mind, he's looking for it. Uh, Harrison had said something in the chat about the seven rays, talking about that as a se that's a segment in the secret doctrine. So he says he's looking for it now to, to tell me what passage uh, I should read here. Cool. But he's also complimenting your haircut. Did you see that? It does oh, look nice. No, it looks, looks good. Yeah, it says nice haircut, Tracy. Well, thanks, guys. That's, that's very nice of you. Should I uh, should I start off with um, some s streams streams in the desert? Who's the author on that one? Uh, someone named Cowman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, before you start, let me uh, let me reveal my bag of tricks and, and tell everybody what I'm doing, and then we'll get right into it. Cause yeah, go for so, it. So um, I'm gonna step out of the way again. This is a painting I started in 2002 or three, and it's called Ozzy Osbourne Fully Proselyzed and Fervently Preaching the Apocalypse. Oh, Jim, I forgot. Yeah. Also, these things, these things are being ceremoniously removed. And what we'd like to do is encourage you that if anybody wants to see these completed, this and the two sculptures of the Bogdanovs, we're gonna take them out of here they're not going to be in the studio anymore. I'm going to put up some places to support us on uh, Patreon, extra places to click on Patreon. And uh, let's put these into post-production, completion, and into reproduction. You can get prints, get mouse pads, get coffee cups, get t-shirts. Oh, good idea. Uh, I don't know. We could do photography of your sculptures and do the same with those. But I'm taking this Bogdanoff away. I guess this part. This Goodbye, Bogdanoff. That's right. Everybody say goodbye, Bogdanov. I think this is Grichka. Goodbye, Bogdanov. Remember what's it? Grichka. This is Grichka. Oh, and Grichka. Now you have to go way back to see me painting this one. That was the first one. Goodbye. Goodbye, Grichka. What's the other guy's name, Jim? Do you remember? Uh, Igor. Igor. Yes. And so I'll bring uh, I'll bring them over here carefully so everyone can give them a kiss. Kiss your Bogdanovs goodbye. Ooh, I don't want to go past the microphone. Can you see him right there or not? You have to turn yeah. him around a little bit there. <laughs> there they are. I guess, is Trump allowed to stay? We can mold and reproduce these. In bronze would be very expensive. We could put them in some kind of a resin or foam. And what, you think we'd get the price down to less than 100 bucks probably. But the molding. That's a bargain. Yeah, I mean, bronze would be very expensive, obviously. Yeah. I think we could figure something out. We could cast them in tin. Is there a tin foundry around? Uh, maybe. No. Aluminum would be easier. Let's see. Let's, uh... Never heard of anybody casting I'm going to make a special offer right now. That, uh... If the... The two guys that made the bigger donations on the RX Only Picture Show Patreon want to private message me, Jim, or Tracy their personal information. I will mail you one of these original proofs. This is what I used to reference and paint those pictures. These are my sit on the toilet and make art meme things. Did I say that? Man, everybody does it. Stop scrolling and wipe now, Sean. <laughs> Has anybody ever, have you ever seen that meme? It's like an old black lady and she's like giving you the point and like accusatory smiling look. And that's what it says. You scrolled long enough, now wipe. Like if you're actually sitting in the toilet and it, that comes that's up, it's funny. so embarrassing. <laughs> she's right. She's right. But yeah, I know uh, Carrie Ibis and um, I think it was Snake Jones was the other main donator to our channel. I don't remember. And um, honestly, if you... Uh, if you have not yet signed up for Plus Ultra and you are interested to take advantage of Tracy's continuing discount, the original discount offer ended on Valentine's Day. That's Michael Bloomberg's birthday. Um, so Papa Smurf's birthday sale went well enough that Tracy extended the sale. I think it was $50 still at a discount. Is that going to 
Is that right? I saw that you posted an ex extension. They correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're right. And so right now, like at, at this exact moment, you could get a year for fifty bucks uh, if you use PayPal, and then I think there's a slightly different amount if you use the the Stripe checkout. Uh, and that's just because PayPal money is available right away. So to me, you know, like I could go buy a sandwich with it. Right. So that's the reason why I dangled that little carrot. But anyway, yeah, there's de definitely significantly lower prices at the moment. And I don't have an exact date yet of when it's going to end, but uh, I'm just seeing if we can bring some new people in, seeing if it's going to work out mathematically uh, to do that. Who knows uh, what the future holds, but it did seem like the sale went well, so I'd like to do some more of that. Absolutely. Yeah. And what I was going to say is um, either one of these pictures or just about any picture from my Instagram, I'll add it to the description after the show. It's Neo Soweo because I spelled it wrong. Um, if you sign up because of this announcement, I'll send you one of these or one from my Instagram just because you signed up. If you want one otherwise, I'd say $5.55. Same thing, you can PayPal it or Patreon it to me, and I'll put it in an envelope and mail it off to you. So. That's awesome. Well, thank you for offering that. Absolutely. I, I want one myself. You get you get stuff for free. I get a comp one. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. You get you get one for free. Thanks. If you'll promise to hang it with the other Olympic gods. <laughs> <laughs> you get little little do you know, Tracy's sitting on Mount Olympus, and I can't say any more than that. <laughs> sitting on. Well. You're, you're up at Mount Olympus, let's just say. In my mind, anyway. Because of the, the poster art. I'm totally... Oh, wait, no, you're home. There. I'm lost. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That would have worked if you, if you weren't home. I mean, are we talking about the, the Mercury statue or what? No, sure no, what I'm talking, talking about? about at your office, there's a terrific amount of Olympic... Um, Oh, artistic yeah. design so to me in my mind that's what i thought oh like tracy's at mount olympus that's where she works each day <laughs> up on mount olympus because she's a goddess i forgot about that whole thing yes okay so, so here's Olympic here's my bag of tricks what i'm going to use to to make stuff with wow you guys might have been suspicious that i was a mason and you're right oh the compass is on the bogdanoff thing that's okay I'll there's, there's the square actually i'm not a mason but I, where's a cult fan oh there he is this is that's, that's a cultic man. This is specifically for a cult fan. It's all about it, baby. What's up? What's up? Screen capture this and make it into a weird meme. <laughs> yeah, Look at that. You might actually need that. I brought this because your goose is cooked, man. It's all <laughs> over, Alger. Sometimes you need to magnify things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Quite a bag of tricks there. Uh, I I save all the different little colored nets off of the vegetables. I can't help myself. And then I stash them away from my girlfriend because if she sees too many of them, she'll be like, would you throw that garbage in the garbage? You know. <laughs> Palette knives so I can do at least some Bob Ross moves. Nice. You know, if you ever want to get really discouraged, just get some palette knives and no brushes and try and make a picture like Bob Ross. <laughs> <laughs> This is also the same tool that uh, Jim and I use when we're um, molding something with a really stinky rubber product. Yeah, Dow Corning 732. Dow Corning 732. So if you've used enough Dow Corning 732, just seeing one of these kind of gives you like, like a PTSD reaction. Like, oh God, but don't worry, brain. So like I said, I wasn't kidding. Lots more little nets. I don't know why I brought them. I think I'm going to try to use texture. Some samples uh, of fabric for a chair that we had covered. I was just going to dump all this out, but I can't do it. Okay, so the rest of the bag. Oh, so yeah, we got paint pens. I'm going to need all this stuff anyway. We need some paint pens, little buckets, expensive glitter, acrylics. I think I stole this from work. Oh, nice. Yeah. All right. Nice pen. So my plan is to make a valid attempt at completing... Ozzy Osbourne fully proselytized and fervently preaching the apocalypse. And honestly, if I finish it, then it's probably for sale as a print or for sale in general. So, all right, Tracy, I think that's good enough. Ooh. Oh, okay. Um, well, I just wanted to say something to Harrison here, who is talking more about this section 
from Blavatsky that he wanted me to read. He said, Seven Creative Gods in Volume 3, Section 21 under Hebrew Allegories. Um, I, I have secret doctrine here. I, I only have two volumes, and uh, I kind of thought that's all there was of that. I don't have, I don't have her other books. I just have that. So I'm a little confused here, but Check it out. anyway. Um, I do have something. There's a chapter here called The Seven Lagu Centers. I have no idea what that is. Um, but anyway, I was going to start off with Streams in the Desert. And this is just a, a, a devotional reading, I guess. See, and I... Tell us the author I, again, please, because the name was great. Okay, the... Well, Calman. Calman, Calman. Mrs. Chase E. Calman. And this was the 39th printing of Streams in the Desert. Let's see, when was it actually published? So this one was pr printed in 1925. Oh, wait, 1950. And they had already done 39 of them, so... I guess it was pretty, uh, you know, it was an evergreen product back then. And so it has a different read, you know, a different um, devotional thing for every day of the week. So today's the 20th. That's the only reason why I'm reading this one. Um, so, and I've not read it before. Any, in fact, almost anything I'm reading tonight, I haven't read before, except maybe one story that I had in mind. So in other words, I can't guarantee the quality of this stuff, folks. Please be forgiving um, to Tracy as her initial plan was different than this one, and she's having to maybe improvise a little more than she really wanted to. <laughs> okay. So anyway, nothing shall be impossible unto you. That's a quote from Matthew 17, 20. Oh, and I should add, too, that there's some notes from my aunt, my great aunt Imogene. See, that's who sent this to me years ago when I was going through a tough spot and she thought that this would be helpful to me. So she sent me her, co her copy of this that she had had for years. Nice. And you can see all of her notations in it. And you, some of them are different colored ink. So you can tell that she went through this book year after year and read the same passages each day every year and made her notations on it. And her name and is one. Imogene? Yes. Yeah, that's great. That's, I, have, I have a similar, uh, similar book. Oh, yeah. cool. So go, go right ahead, please. Today's devotional. Sure. Uh, it is possible for those who really are willing to reckon. Is she wrote, she scratched, scratched out reckon and wrote depend. <laughs> like uh, either that maybe that was to help her understand what the sentence was <laughs> next time she read it. I don't know. Okay, so it is possible for those who really are willing to reckon on the power of the Lord for keeping and victory to lead a life in which his promises are taken as they stand and are found to be true. It is possible to cast all our care upon him daily and to enjoy deep peace in doing it. It is possible to have, actually, you know, I should be putting some emphasis on it is possible because that is italicized. It is possible to have the thoughts and imaginations of our hearts purified in the deepest meaning of the word. It is possible to see the will of God in everything and to receive it, not with sighing, but with singing. It is possible by taking complete refuge in divine power to become strong through and through. And where previously our greatest weakness lay, to find that things which formerly upset all our resolves to be patient or pure or humble furnish today an opportunity through him who loves us and works in us an agreement with his will and a blessed sense of his presence and his power to make sin powerless over us. These things are divine possibilities and because they are his work, the true experience of them will always cause us to bow lower at his feet and to learn to thirst and long for more. We cannot possibly justify excuse me, we cannot possibly be satisfied with anything less. Each day, each hour, each moment in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit than to walk with God. And that's a quote from H.G.C. Mule. Here's another quote. We may have as much of God as we will. Christ puts the key of the treasure chamber into our hand and bids us take all that we want. If a man is admitted into the bullion vault of a bank, and told to keep himself, 
and told to keep himself and comes out with one cent, whose fault is it that he is poor? Whose fault is it that Christian people generally have such scanty portions of the free riches of God? That's a quote from someone named McLaren. And then there's some notes in the liner, but I think that... So I let's... That, can, I, can I hear that last quote one more time? So if a man goes in and he's told to not take any money and he takes one cent, is that, is that saying that it, it's like... It's an allegory of um, the tiniest bit of dishonesty is still dishonesty. Am I right? Is that... I, I got a little bit confused about it, so yeah, I'll read it again. If a man is admitted into the bullion vault of a bank... Oh, sorry. I read it wrong. And told to help himself and, out, and comes out with one cent, whose fault is it that he is poor? Whose fault is it that Christian people generally have such scanty portions of the free riches of God? So, so it's it's just telling you like, it's telling you that you should go ahead and help yourself. Right. You know, it's, that it's somehow, saying you know, God, God says take all you want. So if you don't, it's on you, fool. Yeah. So hallelujah, right. amen, amen to that. That's cool. <laughs> all right. Um, should I let's see? Should I read a ghost story? I don't. I think you should read tomorrow's devotion too, because we're not going to be able to get one otherwise. So. Okay. Because, I mean, today's done, you know. That, so let's... And let's, it's, it's actually tomorrow in certain time zones. I'm yeah, sure some yeah. of our, for some of our viewers, it's the 21st already. We're in the Pacific time zone, so it's the 20th for us still for a few, a few more hours. I guess it's only 11 in, on the East Coast, right? Hey. <laughs> um, all right, here we go. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalm 37, 7. Have you prayed and prayed and waited and waited and still there is no manifestation? Everybody say amen. 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 <laughs> hey, but when I, when I move this microphone, do you guys hear it? Yeah, yeah. It's, you can definitely hear the, the moving of it. If you take that red right. thing off of there, as long as you keep it below your mouth, it'll probably make that less. Really? Okay. How was that? You guys like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean the ripping sound. Okay, so uh, are you tired of seeing nothing move? Are you just at the point of giving it all up? Perhaps you have not waited in the right way. Jeez, perhaps you have not waited in the right, right way. I should have waited differently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> this would take you out of the right place, the place where he can meet you. With patience, wait, Romans 8.25. Patience takes away worry. He said he would come, and his promise is equal to his presence. Patience takes away your weeping. Why, do you, no, why feel sad and despondent? He knows your need better than you do, and his purpose in waiting is to bring more glory of it all, glory out of it all. Patience takes away self-works. The work he desires is that you believe, John 6, 29. And when you believe, you may then know that all is well. Patience takes away all want. Your desire for the thing you wish is perhaps stronger than your desire for the will of God to be fulfilled in its arrival. Patience takes away all weakening. Instead of having the delaying time, a time of letting go, Know that God is getting a larger supply ready and must get you ready to. You're here. Hey, <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Patiently, uh, Tracy. I know. I, I'm not <laughs> waiting, right? Okay. Patience takes away all wobbling. Make me stand upon my standing. Daniel 8.18. Patience takes away all wobbling? That's what it says. <laughs> That's weird. Ralph wobbles too much. I can, I can feel the picture show memes arriving <laughs> on that one. God's foundations are steady, and when his patience is within, we are steady while we wait. Patience gives worship. A praiseful patience, sometimes long-suffering with joyfulness. Okay. Oh, sometimes long-suffering with joyfulness, and that's a quote from... What, oh, like 
Colossians, is that right? Something like yeah, that? Okay, Colossians, yeah. Okay. See, see, uh, Colossians 1, 11. Okay. So a praiseful, praiseful patience sometimes, quote, long suffering with joyfulness is the best part of it all. Wow. Suffering is the best part, part of it all. Okay. Let all the <laughs> phases... <laughs> Christian literature. Let all of these phases of patience have her perfect work. While you wait, and you will find great enrichment. I'll bet everyone was practicing that while they were watching the memes roll. And even as they were waiting for the memes to begin rolling, they were waiting the right way. So thank you. That's why we're here. <laughs> Hold steady. Yeah, otherwise we wouldn't have showed up. <laughs> you made it happen. With, with God's help, of course. Hold steady when the fires burn, when inner lessons come to learn. And from this path, there seems no turn. Let patience have her perfect work. And that's a quote from someone named LSP. All right. Hallelujah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> and now Jacob, I will... Jacob Bacchus says, God does everything. He slices, he dices, he makes thousands of Julian fries. <laughs> all right oh there's i told you guys uh you know as we were warming up here that um i have a book about tapping and it's actually written by the woman whose tapping video we watched a few episodes ago so that's something we could delve into here um separated all the print and what? It's weird. I'm just, uh, I'm marveling it. Like, I, I ripped this t-shirt up and, you know, put some of it on my head and some of it around my neck. This is, honestly, this is a redundant part of my artistic process, believe it or not. But it had print on it, and I just noticed that the bottom half separated perfectly. It's even, and none of the print is on there, and I just thought that was very strange. You know? Wow. <laughs> Makes me think that uh, what was the the lady from Hairspray? That's a, it's a tra it's a it's a man. Divine, divine, you'd probably wear this as a mini skirt. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna read right. some tapping? Yeah, why not? Okay, so here's a chapter called "How Do You Really Feel About Money." Not abundance, money. Oh, the the author here, Margaret M. Lynch. I'm pretty yep. sure that's the same lady we were watching before so how badly do you want more money enough to, to look inside of yourself to find out what's blocking the flow of money to you enough to face emotions that have been buried for many years enough to be honest with yourself about how you really feel about money every time you deal with it we're inundated with financial books tv shows and workshops yet many people continue to wonder why don't i have more money it's like uh remember when when Mrs. Clinton said, why aren't I 20 points ahead? Yeah, that's right. Because she wasn't tapping. Exactly. Put down the baby blood and tap, Hillary. <laughs> All of your problems can be solved by blaming yourself. And specifically blaming yourself for not thinking right. Or waiting and right. she knows that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so even with all the available resources and tools that could change one's financial picture, a vast majority of people never implement what they learn because actions are driven by how they feel right now. How do you want to feel in the future? How you want to feel in the future has no bearing. Feelings power actions. They have precedence over logic, practicality, discipline, and great ideas. If you feel neutral about something, then logic, reason, and choice guide actions. But if you don't, your emotions commandeer what you do or don't do. Memories, beliefs, and programming about money create strong feelings that drive every action you take and motivate you to avoid taking actions that involve increasing your income and savings and lowering your debt. That's why many financial experts are fantastic money managers for their clients, but amass their own significant debt or live hand to mouth. Wow, I didn't know that. Since they're neutral about their clients' money, they're logical, even brilliant. But it's the opposite with their own money. I wonder, 
how she knows this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I have a I have an anecdote that goes with that. I had a, a close friend, a Jewish girl, who literally was uh, managing finances for transnational corporations. She's like, I could totally balance the books on five billion dollars, but under a deadline for the upcoming quarter and get it perfect. But I can't balance my own checkbook. I mean, that's what she said to me. <laughs> well. <laughs> It's it's different because, you know, the, okay, a budget is where you have resources and then you're deciding where to put them. But if you, the resources that you have in your own personal budget aren't adequate under any measure, you know, and it's, there's no way to scale down your needs any further, then you're not really making budget decisions. You know, you're just deciding what what pain to endure this week yeah. you know it's yeah. like I, I i just think it's a totally different thing no i agree and plus okay if she's managing accounts with billions of dollars or millions then her ability to do that without an error well there's probably a margin you know that's that would really impact her own budget but if she gets it within a hundred or a thousand dollars on the big budget then probably everyone's going to say that, you know, that was successful. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not to, not to discount what your friend was observing or what this lovely tap bean expert is observing. Well, I'd say, I'd say I, I relate to it because, like, if Jim said, here's a thousand bucks, I can't spend it, and I can't get to my bank, hold on to this for me, there's pretty much zero chance I would spend the money. Unless right. it was literally life and death, you know, that, I mean... Pretty much. I mean, that, I, you know, if like, okay, my baby's going to die. Like, all right, well, here's Jim's thousand bucks. But other than that, there's no way I'm going to spend it. My own thousand bucks, if I carry it around in my pocket, well, Magic as beans. soon as I break the first hundred dollar bill, the rest of the thousand is down to about a dollar ninety eight in no time. <laughs> Especially if I walk into a music store or a record store or anything like that. So. Yeah. You know what you mean? Okay, so. Uh, How do we tap our way out of this, Tracy? <laughs> I don't know, yeah, um, let's see if there's something important to jump to here. I doubt it. Oh, well, we want to know what the exercises are, don't we? So yeah. let's just skip, let's skip the philosophy here and get to the exercises. Uh, tapping, this is, like, apparently there's scripts for tapping. Scripts? So, yes. So this is a tapping script for emotions about income. Say the following phrases aloud while tapping on the karate chop point on the pinky side of your hand. Oh my goodness. So like, like, I'm not going to do it because... We'll do it. You you just keep reading. So, But she's describing something like, like this, you think? Uh, I can't see you. Hold on a sec. I need to, I need to re-secure my door here. Hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll wait. Everybody tap with us. We're trying to... Um, 40 is the number of authority and power, or 4, the number 4 is, is like authority, power, like they call it the cop's number. And so I was thinking, you know, the combination of art and the authority that we need to bring some money. We, we all want a lot more money so that we can make... We want this to be a 24-hour show. 24 hours a day, 6 days a week. But it's going to be expensive, so... <laughs> <laughs> so... So okay. <laughs> this is the the pinky right, side so, karate chop tap like. All right, here we go. Even though the truth is I try to be positive, this number is just not enough. What number? <laughs> Sorry, um, no, I'm I'm presuming that's the number of. Uh, yeah, she must have gave us a number. That you have. Yeah, she must have. She must have gave us a number or reference to a number that we didn't. Uh, that we didn't read when we skipped. But we can all assume that the number is not enough. Yes, hear, yes. hear, hallelujah, okay. it's, it's not enough. And I really feel that right in my, and I really feel that right in my stomach. It is depressing, it is scary, it is hopeless, and I am really disappointed. I totally honor all of these real feelings, and I am so open to healing them because this is a conflict. Even though this money just isn't enough, I am going to accept all of my awful feelings about that, this hopeless feeling, this debt, sh this deep shame. Shouldn't I be ashamed? All my disappointment and all my fears. Oh my God, what if it never changes? I am really feeling the pain of money. 
even though my money just isn't enough. This is depressing me. Even though my money just isn't enough, I am just not earning enough. And that is the truth. I honor who I am anyway, the loser that I am. I added that. And all this heavy <laughs> looked at about money. I feel so, it feels so disappointing, depressing. It is a battle. Continue tapping through all the points using the following phrases. Refer to the diagram in chapter two, which <laughs> chapter we don't know about. Two. Okay. <laughs> this feeling in my stomach, oh, I don't want to look at this. My income just isn't enough. I try to be positive. I have been positive for years. Yeah, right. Obviously not. Not enough. Uh, and it is still not enough. It hasn't ever been enough. This is really scary. It feels hopeless. Goodness. I might have to email this Dis lady. <laughs> Disappointing and shameful. shameful. It is just not enough. Panic, fear, depression, anger. Every time I think about money, every time I see my income, it is really hard to be grateful when I feel so bad. It is just not enough. I'm still tapping. Okay. Good, good. That's helping. All right. So take a nice deep breath. breath. Now look at your income number again and voice out loud. It's not enough. This statement may still be very true, but measure again how intense your feelings and reactions are now on the scale of one to 10. This is a great way to see how far you've shifted or if you need to tap through the round again. When the emotional intensity comes down to the scale, comes down on the scale to a one, you can get to the other side and go from fear, sadness, and disappointment to empowerment and a whole new vibe about your income. So get positive. When you disconnect your programmed response, you can instill a new one. You have the space and ability to choose a new way to feel great, excited, and interested and enthusiastic about money. Let's tap again, but this time instilling a powerful, positive affirmation to shift and reframe how you feel about money. Nice. Um, so that was tapping out the bad part, and now we're going to tap in to the bundle, to, to the, to, to, I'm going to say we're going to, folks, tap with us, because we're going to tap our way into Scrooge McDuck's money bin. Only the real one, not a cartoon. Our own personal money bin. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, say the following <laughs> phrases aloud while tapping on the karate chop point. Even though my income still isn't enough, I am totally open to the millions of ways that money can show up for me. Even though this isn't what I wanted to be, wanted it to be, I recognize in the present moment that I am just looking at a result on paper from my past. But in this present moment, I am a powerful manifester, so I am changing my vibration about money. I am totally open to all the ways money can start showing up for me. And everything I need, I am now attracting to me. To allow more money into my life, I am now attracting ideas, inspirations, actions, people, circumstances, anything I need to allow money to show up for me. I am... <laughs> I am opening up my vibration about money by saying one simple word. Yes. 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 I am now saying yes to money. Yes to money. Yes, money. <laughs> All right. No, um, we're not done. Hey. Oh. <laughs> I thought that was it. No, no. Now tap through the points using the following phrases on your own. Look at my money. Looking at my money used to make me a angry or, fear or fearful and depressed. Now when I look at money, I just say yes. I actually love receiving money. It is really fun to get money. Oh, it, it sure is. And actually, I, I am grateful for the money I have right now. I am now open to receiving any kind of legal money. She puts legal in parentheses. Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, she, she's smart. She knows that you know you can't just be flinging things out there like... You can't say, oh, I want a lot of money, and then you find, like, a, By any a, means possible. a bloody bag of, you know, $60,000. Like, hmm, that's not really what I meant. <laughs> yeah. I am saying yes to all sorts and forms of money. Cash, check, or charge. I am saying yes to money. Bitcoin! A whole new... <laughs> we will also take Bitcoin. <laughs> it's literally happening as my son is throwing pennies at me right now <laughs> yes it's working <laughs> tap everybody tap a lot <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna break my wrist <laughs> oh crap i didn't oh, that. Not, 
It's rare to see results so fast, yeah. Tracy. It really is rare to see results so fast. I guess you really got to say it out loud. <laughs> You're getting... Okay, so we're not even done yet. Um, oh, I'm going to say yes to money all day long. When I wake up in the morning, when I go to sleep, yes to money. Even when I dream, I am saying yes to money. I love this vibration. I love this vibration of receiving. I am now receiving and welcoming more money into my home, into, into my business, right into my hands. I am so curious as to how it will show up. Me too. Yeah. This is exciting. I, <laughs> I would think that actually what you're doing is probably better than tapping. Like... If you say this stuff while you're doing art, you know? It's... Oh, yeah, that's right. I stopped tapping and figured, well, if I'm rubbing... What I did, I started by rubbing some uh, some mild paint thinner on the this because it's been sitting in the garage. So I figured, well, uh, well, I'm cleaning this thing off, dusting it off. That's definitely imbuing get the money. Like, maybe that's going to help me sell this particular piece, you know? It, it, you'll probably sell it for tens of thousands of dollars just because of this. Yeah, I think I'm going to sell it to Damien Eccles. Just, okay. kid, just kidding. <laughs> Why? I mean, if he wants it, I'll take his money. I can't lie. That's, you know. That's a, it's all good, homie. You should make that happen. <laughs> Donate half okay. of it straight to Bill Ramsey. <laughs> okay, so I've got three more paragraphs here. All right. I love this vibration. I love this vibration of receiving. I am now receiving and welcoming more money into my home, into my business, right in my hands. I am so curious as to how it will show up. And I am already feeling excited and grateful for more money showing up. Yes to money. Thank you for money. Open to receiving money all the way through me, mind, body, and soul. Here, here. There you go. Now, she could have she could have written a book about all the other, you know, things in life that you could make happen with tapping but i think she knows that that's really the only thing that anyone is is slapping themselves in the face to get and i think she knows where, where her audience is so yeah i doubt, I I doubt people much. are people probably aren't like what well, what are the other main things i mean people might be tapping to lose weight to get money and lose weight they there i could go. imagine some people tapping to like get some sex or at least a nice dinner date <laughs> you know, but hard stuff. I was trying to think of like someone tapping, like what's something challenging and hard? Like, I just can't think Levitating? of Levitating? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Levitating is hard. I, I love, I love, this is why I love Tracy Twyman, folks. That's, that's the kind of answer that I love. Like, what's something hard? Like, most people would say, absolutely impossible to levitate right the most majority of people like can you levitate like no it's a magic trick like not real magic like <laughs> it's just that hard you the craft the, no, the craft is that what you said yeah <laughs> I, if i have it's been so long i don't remember but that's they they, 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 they levitated uh, it? light as a feather feathers oh. as a board, <laughs> oh, I, we, we did that when we were kids yeah that and bloody mary in the mirror well yeah. did anyone levitate well, yeah, with, you put your fingers just barely under their back. It yeah. worked. With, with the help of your friends, you can levitate. Yeah, you get like uh, five or six people, and you just barely, barely put your fingers underneath the edge of their back, and you say, light as a feather, stiff as a board, over and over again, and eventually you can pick them right up off of the floor. But I mean, I always thought it was just, you know, the power of six people lifting their friend off the floor, but it did seem supernatural when we did it, so. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I can't pick anyone up with my fingers, so... I think it, I think I always, maybe you're just trying to rationalize it now. I may be, because I always thought of it the same as the Ouija experience. I, we, we only played with the Ouija board once, and it freaked us out, and we never did it again, because it, like, told us who was going to win the Super Bowl that year accurately and, like, other scary stuff. And so, I mean, I, I, I'm preaching to the choir here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so, Harrison, did you ever find... That segment, like, could you, Harrison, send me a a link to, like, uh, I'm sure all Blavatsky stuff is online. If you can find it, I could just read it off my screen. Because um, I don't think I have that in The Secret Doctrine. Unless I'm just looking in the wrong places. Everything's in two volumes in the one I have. So I'll pick something else at the moment. Um, has anyone ever read 
that is you guys. Um, the Hounds of Tindalos by Frank Belknap Long. No. No. Okay. So this is another guy in the in the vein with um, Lovecraft. Like I think he was a little bit later. Bendelow? But Tindalos. Hounds of Tindalos. Yeah, that sounds curious. I wonder if the audio is on the internet because I'll listen to that. Yeah, there's probably be other people reading it probably better than me. But uh, I just thought I'd throw it in. I remember it very well from, I think I read this when I was 13. And uh, I remember, I like I liked that story better than the Lovecraft story, you know? It, it's a book, here, I'll show you. I like the illustration on it, too. Um, this is a, a collection of things that utilize, you know, the, the world that H.P. Lovecraft created, but there's only one or two of his stories in there, so the rest of them are by other authors. Yeah. So anyway, here we go. <clears throat> I'm glad you came, said Calmers. I'm gonna go ahead and pronounce that Calmers. It's C-H-A-L-M-E-R-S instead of Chalmers. Okay. I don't know, because Chalmers just sounds weird. <laughs> you think that? What do you think? <laughs> it was, you I don't mean, care, do you? No, we, we don't care. I mean, if... The, well, the, I thought you were saying that you were going to do that because the ch sound is, is harder on the mic. And in general, it's harder on the voice to say ch than it is to say k. You know, calmers, it comes out easier. Less diphthong, as they say. I'm going to say, we're going to say calmers. And I guess I'll get uh, made fun of later if I'm wrong. Sorry. I'll apologize in advance, too. I am sorry that I'm going to mispronounce this person's name. Okay. I'm glad you came, said Calmers. He was sitting by the window, and his face was very pale. Two tall candles guttered at his elbow and cast a sickly amber light over his long nose and slightly receding chin. Calmers would have, would have nothing modern about his apartment. He had the soul of a medieval ascetic, and he preferred illuminated manuscripts to automobiles and leering, sto leering stone gargoyles to radios and adding machines. As I crossed the room to the settee he had, cleared, he had cleared for me, I glanced at his desk and was surprised to discover that he had been studying the mathematical formulae of a celebrated contemporary physicist and that he had covered many sheets of thin yellow paper with curious geometric designs. Oh, this is so funny. It's a coincidence in my life. All right, so <laughs> <laughs> I was just seeing what's coming next, and it, uh, it, it syncs up with something that I was working on today. So, quote, Einstein and John Dee are strange bedfellows, I said as my gaze wandered from his mathematical charts to the 60 or 70 quaint books that comprised his strange little library. Plotinus and Emmanuel Moscopulus, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Frenical de Bessy stood elbow to elbow in the somber ebony bookcase, and chairs, table, and desk were littered with pamphlets about medieval sorcery and witchcraft and black magic and all of the valiant, glamorous things that the modern world has repudiated. Calmers smiled engagingly and passed me a Russian cigarette on a curiously carved tray. We're just discovering now, he said, that the old alchemists and sorcerers were two thirds right, and that your modern biologist and materialist is nine tenths wrong. You have always scoffed at modern science, I said a little impatiently. Only at scientific dogma dogmatism, he replied. I have always been a rebel, a champion of originality and lost causes. That is why I have chosen to repudiate, repudiate the conclusions of tempor contemporary biologists. And Einstein, I asked, a priest of transcendental mathematics, he murmured reverently, a profound mystic and explorer of the great suspected. Then you do not entirely despise science. Of course not, he affirmed. I merely distrust the scientific positiv positivism, positivism of the past 50 years, the positivism of Haeckel and Darwin and of Mr. Bertrand Russell. I believe that biology has failed pitifully to explain the mystery of man's origin and destiny. Give them time, I retorted. Calmer's eyes glowed. My friend, he murmured, your pun is sublime. Give, give them time. That is precisely what I would do. But your modern biologist scoffs at time. 
He has the key, but he refuses to use it. What do we know of time, really? Einstein believes that it is relative, that it can be interpreted in terms of space, of curved space, of curved space. But we must stop, but must we stop there? When mathematics fails us, can we not advance by insight? <clears throat> insight. Okay, you are treading on dangerous ground, I replied. That is a pitfall that your true investigator avoids. That is why modern science has advanced so slowly. It accepts nothing it cannot demonstrate. But you, I would take hashish, opium, all manner of drugs. I would emulate the sages of the East. And then perhaps I would apprehend, what? The fourth dimension. Theosophical rubbish. Perhaps, but I believe that drugs expand human consciousness. William James agreed with me. And I have discovered a new one. A new one? A new drug? It was used centuries ago by Chinese alchemists, but it is virtually unknown in the West. Its occult properties are amazing. With its aid and the aid of my mathematical knowledge, I believe I can go back through time. I do not understand. Time is merely our imperfect perception of a new dimension of space. Time and motion are both illusions. Everything that has existed from the beginning of the world exists now. Events that occurred centuries ago on this planet continue to exist in another dimension of space. Events that will occur centuries from now exist already. We cannot perceive their existence because we cannot enter the dimension of space that contains them. Human beings as we know them are merely fractions, infinitesimally, infinitesimally small fractions of one enormous whole. Every human being is linked with all the life that has preceded him on this planet. All of his ancestors are parts of him. Only time separates him from his forebears, and time is an illusion and does not exist. I think I understand, I murmured. It will be sufficient for my purpose if you can form a vague idea of what I wish to achieve. I wish to strip from my eyes the veils of illusion that time has thrown over them and see the beginning and the end. And you think this new drug will help you? I am sure that it will. And I want you to help me. I intend to take this drug immediately. I cannot wait. I must see. His eyes glittered strangely. I am going back, th back through time. He rose and strode to the mantle. When he faced me again, he was holding a small square box in the palm of his hand. I have here five pellets of the drug Lieo. It was used by the Chinese philosopher Lao Zi. We, we talked about this before, how to pronounce that guy's name. Yeah. Lao Zi. Lao Lao Zi. <laughs> this I meal sure is it. lousy. <laughs> is that what you said? While, Did you say yayo? Or leo with an L? Leo. Leo, okay. Leo Z. Leo Sean, Z. Sean's giving himself away. You said you called it yayo? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> leo. All right. And while under its influence, he visioned Dao. Dao is the most, the most mysterious force in the world. It surrounds and pervades all things. It contains the visible universe and everything that we call reality. He, he who apprehends the mysteries of Dao sees clearly all that was and will be. Rubbish, I retorted. Dao resembles a great animal, recumbent, motionless, containing in its enormous body all the worlds of our universe, the past, the present, and the future. We see portions of this great monster through a slit, which we call time. With the aid of this drug, I shall enlarge the slit. I shall behold the great figure of life, the great recumbent beast in its entirety. And what do you wish me to do? Watch, my friend. Watch and take notes. And if I go back too far, you must recall me to reality. You can recall me by shaking me violently. If I appear to be suffering acute physical pain, you must recall me at once. Palmers, I said, I wish you wouldn't make this experiment. You are taking dreadful risks. I don't believe that there is any fourth dimension, and I emphatically do not believe in Tao. I, do, I don't approve of your experimenting with unknown drugs. I know the properties of this drug, he replied. I know precisely, precisely how it affects the human animal, and I know its dangers. The risk does not reside in the drug itself. My only fear is that I may become lost in time. You see, I shall assist the drug before I swallow this pellet. 
I shall give my undivided attention to the geometric and algebraic symbols that I have traced on this paper. He raised the mathematical chart that rested on his knee. I shall prepare my mind for an excursion into time. I shall approach the fourth dimension with my conscious mind before I take the drug which will enable me to exercise occult powers of perception. Before I enter the dream world of the Eastern mystic, I shall acquire all of the mathematical help that modern science can offer. The mathematical knowledge, this conscious approach to an actual apprehension of the fourth dimension of time will supplement the work of the drug. The drug will open up stupendous new vistas. The mathematical preparation will, na will enable me to grab, excuse me, grasp them intellectually. I have oft often grasped the fourth dimension in dreams, emotionally, intuitively, but I've never been able to recall in waking life the occult splendors that were mom momentarily revealed to me. But with your aid, I believe that I can recall them. You will take down everything that I say while I am under the influence of the drug. No matter how strange or incoherent my speech may become, you will omit nothing. When I awake, I may be able to supply the key to whatever is mysterious or incredible. I am not sure that I shall succeed, but if I do succeed, his eyes were strangely luminous. Time will exist for me no longer. He sat down abruptly. I shall make the experiment at once. Please stand over there while uh, by the window and watch. Have you a fountain pen? I nodded gloomily and removed a pale green waterman from my upper vest pocket. And a pad, Frank? I groaned and produced a memorandum book. <laughs> I, emphatically, <laughs> I emphatically disapprove of this experiment, I muttered. You're taking a dreadful risk. Don't be an asinine old woman, he admonished. Nothing that you can say will induce me to stop now. I was I imagining him, to, him, the other person, to be a man this whole time. So that changed the whole story for me. Sorry to interrupt, but... I think it is a man. No, it, it is a man. He's, he's oh, insulting he's, his friends. He's, no. Yeah, okay. I'm. Thank you. Thank you. That makes more sense. I mean, the, my recollection is it's a it's a, a man. He's carrying a waterman in his pocket, so his upper vest pocket. Yeah. No, you're I right. Don't think he's he's insulting him by calling him a woman. <laughs> yes. An old woman. <laughs> Nothing but, that you can say will induce me to stop now. I entreat you to remain silent while I study these charts. He raised the charts and studied them intently. I watched the clock on the mantel as it ticked out of ticked out the seconds, and a curious dread clutched at my heart so that I choked. Suddenly the clock stopped ticking, and exactly at that moment, Palmer swallowed the drug. I rose quickly and moved towards him. But his eyes implored me not to interfere. The clock has stopped, he murmured. Forces that control it approve of my experiment. Time stopped, and I swallowed the drug. I pray God that I shall not lose my way. He closed his eyes and leaned back on the sofa. All of the blood had left his face, and he was breathing heavily. It was clear that the drug was acting with extraordinary rapidity. It is beginning to get dark, he murmured. Write that. It is beginning to get dark, and the familiar objects in the room are fading out. I can discern them vaguely through my eyelids, but they are fading swiftly. I am leaving the room. The walls are vanishing, and I can no longer see any of the familiar objects. Your face, though, is still visible to me. I hope that you are writing. I think that I am about to make a great leap, a leap through space, or perhaps it is through time that I, sh I shall make the leap. I cannot tell. Everything is dark, indistinct. He sat for a while silent, with his head sunk upon his breast. Then suddenly he stiffened and his eyelids fluttered open. God in heaven, he cried, I see. He was straining forward in his chair, staring at the opposite wall. But I knew that he was looking beyond the wall and that the objects in the room no longer existed for him. Calmers, I cried, Calmers, shall I wake you? Do not, he shrieked, I see everything. All of the billions of lives that preceded me on this planet are before me at this moment. I see men of all ages, all races, all colors. They are fighting, killing, building, dancing, singing. They are sitting about rude fires on lonely gray deserts and flying through the air in monoplanes. They are riding the seas in bark canoes and enormous steamships. They are painting bison and mammoths on the walls of dismal caves and covering huge canvases with clear, or excuse me, queer, tutoristic designs. I think that's a typo. Because I don't think tutoristic is a word, right? It's probably I think a typo. It's, yeah, futuristic. Futuristic signs. I watched the 
migrations from Atlantis. I watched the migrations from Lemuria. I watched the elder races, a strange horde of black dwarfs overwhelming Asia and the Neanderthals with lowered heads and bent knees ranging obscenely across Europe. I watched the Achaeans, Achaeans streaming into the Greek islands and the crude beginnings of Hellenic culture. I am in Athens and Pericles is young. I am standing on the soil of Italy. I assist in the rape of the Sabines. I watch <laughs> with the Imperial. He, he said he the rape of the Sabines. Huh? He said he assists? Yep. <laughs> rape assistance, that's a rare, a rare uh, position to fill. If you go back in time far enough, it probably isn't. <laughs> probably a position in the army, rape assistant. I march with the imperial legions. I tremble with awe and wonder as the enormous standards go by and the ground shakes with the tread of the victorious Hastati. A thousand naked slaves grovel before me as I pass in a, li a litter of gold and ivory drawn by night black oxen from Thebes. And the flower girls scream, Ave Caesar, as I nod and smile. I am myself a slave on a Moorish galley. I watch the erection of a great cathedral. Stone by stone it rises. And through months and years, I stand and watch each stone as it falls into place. I am burned on a cross, head downward, in the time-scented gardens of Nero. And I watch with amusement and scorn the torturers at work in the chambers of the Inquisition. I walk in the holiest sanctuaries. I enter the temples of Venus. I kneel in adoration before the Magna Mater. That's Cybele, or Cybele, you know. And I throw coins on the bare knees of the sacred courtesans who sit with veiled faces in the groves of Babylon. I creep into the Elizabethan theater and with the stinking rabble, the stinking rabble about me, I applaud the merchant of Venice. I walk with Dante through the narrow streets of Florence. I meet the young Beatrice and the hem of her garment brushes my sandals as I stare in rapture. I am a priest of Isis, and my magic astounds the nations. Simon Magus kneels before me, imploring my assistance, and Pharaoh trembles when I approach. In, in, in India, I talk with the masters and run screaming from their presence, for their revelations are as salt on wounds that bleed. I perceive everything simultaneously. I perceive everything from all sides. I am a part of all the teeming billions about me. I exist in all men and all men exist in me. I perceive the whole of human history in a single instant, the past and the present. He's tripping, man. Yeah. He's tripping. <laughs> by simply straining, I can, straining, I'm supposed to emphasize that, by simply straining, I can see farther and farther back. Now I am going back through strange curves and angles. Angles and curves multiply about me. I perceive great segments of time through curves. There is curved time and angular time. The beings that exist in angular time cannot enter curved time. It is very strange. Going back to 2D space. Hold on. Adam Laura said Tralfamadorianism. That's the that's the the aliens from Kurt Vonnegut's novels, they describe being able to see human beings as all phases of their life. Mm. Wow. I don't think I've read that one yet. It's a good one. I am going back and back. Man has disappeared from the earth. Gigantic reptiles crouch beneath enormous palms and swim through the loathly black waters of dismal lakes. Now the reptiles have disappeared. No animals remain upon the land, but beneath the waters, plainly visible to me, dark forms move slowly over the rotting vegetation. The forms are becoming simpler and simpler. Now they are single cells. All about me there are angles, strange angles that have no counterparts on the earth. I am desperately afraid. There is an abyss of being which man has never fathomed. I stared. Calmer had risen with, to his feet and he was gesticulating helplessly with his arms. I am passing through unearthly angles. I am approaching, oh, the burning horror of it. Calmers, I cried, do you wish me to interfere? He brought his right hand quickly before his face, as though to shut out a vision unspeakable. Not yet, he cried, I will go on. I will see what lies beyond. 
<laughs> there is more beyond. A cold sweat streamed from his forehead, and his shoulders jerked spasmodically. Beyond life, there are... His face grew ashen with terror. Things that I cannot distinguish. They move slowly through angles. They have no bodies, and they move slowly through outrageous angles. It was then that I became aware of the odor in the room. It was a pungent, indescribable odor, so nauseous that I could scarcely endure it. I stepped quickly to the window and threw it open. When I returned to Calmer's and looked into his eyes, I nearly fainted. I think they have scented me, he shrieked. They are slowly turning toward me. He was trembling horribly. For a moment, he clawed at the air with his hands. Then his legs gave way beneath him, and he fell forward on his face, slobbering and moaning. I watched him in silence as he dragged himself across the floor. He was no longer a man. His teeth were bared, and saliva dripped from the corners of his mouth. Calmers, I cried. Calmers, stop it. Stop it. Do you hear? As if in reply to my appeal, he commenced to utter hoarse, convulsive sounds, which resembled nothing so much as the barking of a dog, and began a sort of hideous writhing in a circle about the room. I bent and seized him by the shoulders. Violently, desperately, I shook him. He turned his head and snapped at my wrist. I was sick with horror, but I dared not release him for fear that he would destroy himself in a paroxysm of rage. Were you about to say something? No, no. I just, uh, okay. I'm just laughing at his, uh, his friend now. Like this, this is the part where any any of the rest of us would probably intervene, right? Yeah. Like I, I went with you this far, Jim, but now I'm football tackling and slapping you around a little bit. Let's stop turning into a werewolf. Or you took too you're, much. Whatever you're doing, yeah. Change your shorts, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Please go ahead, Tracy. <laughs> it's all right. I think Laura just asked what the book is. So once again, it's The Hounds of Tendalos. Or that's the name of the story. The book it's in is Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos, Volume 1. And the author is Frank Belknap Long. And how old were you when you first read it, Tracy? Uh, Actually, I was 11. I remember. Okay. And I... I really like the whole thing about the angles and the curves, which they're going to explain more as we go on here. Okay, so, oh, it's the wrong page. Okay. I continued to shake and admonish him, and gradually the madness died out of his face. Shivering convulsively, he crumpled into a grotesque heap on the Chinese rug. I carried him to the sofa and deposited him upon it. His features were twisted in pain, and I knew that he was still struggling. What? Well, I didn't say anything. Did you say something, Jim? Oh. Weird. It's Somebody the, did. Maybe the, it was them. It's the angles. They're talking to us. I know. Tap us <laughs> some money. <laughs> I don't think they do that. That's not. These aren't the guys that give you money. These are the guys that give you money. <laughs> they mark us with their scent. All right, so he, I carried him to the sofa and deposited him upon it. His features were twisted in pain, and I knew that he was still struggling dumbly to escape from abominable memories. Whiskey, he muttered. You'll find a flask in the cabinet by the window, upper left-hand drawer. When I handed him the flask, his fingers tightened about, about it until the knuckles showed blue. They nearly got me, he gasped. He drained the stimulant in immoderate gulps, and gradually the color crept back into his face. That drug was the very devil, I murmured. It wasn't the drug, he moaned. His eyes no longer glared insanely, but he still wore the look of a lost soul. They scented me in time, he moaned. I went too far. What were they like, I said, to humor him. He leaned forward and gripped my arm. He was shivering horribly. No words in our language can describe them. He spoke in a hoarse whisper. They are symbolized vaguely in the myth of the fall and in an obscene form, which is occasionally found engraved on ancient tablets. The Greeks had a name for them, which veiled their essential foulness. The tree, the snake, and the apple, these are the vague symbols of a most awful mystery. His voice had risen to a scream. Frank, Frank, a terrible and unspeakable deed was done in the beginning. Before time, the deed, and from the deed, he had risen and was hysterically pacing the room. 
The deeds of the dead move through angles in dim recesses of time. They are hungry and athirst. Calmers, I pleaded to, I pleaded quiet, I pleaded to quiet him. We are living in the third decade of the 20th century. They are lean and athirst, he shrieked. The hounds of Tendalos. Calmers, shall I phone for a physician? A physician cannot help me now. They are horrors of the soul, and yet he hid his face from his in his hands and groaned. They are real, Frank. I saw them for a ghastly moment. For a moment I stood on the other side. I stood on the pale gray shores beyond time and space. In an awful light that was not light, in a silence that shrieked, I saw them. All the evil in the universe was concentrated in their lean, hungry bodies. Or had they bodies? I saw them only for a moment. I cannot be certain, but I heard them breathe. Indescribable for a moment, I felt their breath upon my face. They turned toward me and I fled screaming. In a single moment, I fled screaming through time. I fled down quintillions of years, but they scented me. Men awaken them cosmic hungers. We have escaped momentarily from the foulness that brings them round. They thirst for that in us, which is clean, which is clean which emerged from the deed without stain. There is a part of us which did not partake in the deed and that they hate, but do not imagine that they are literally prosaically evil. They are beyond good and evil as we know it. They are that which in the beginning fell away from cleanliness. Through the deed, they became bodies of death, receptacles of all foulness. But they are not evil in our sense because in the spheres through which they move, there is no thought, no moral no right or wrong as we understand it. There is merely the pure and the foul. The foul expresses itself through angle, the pure through curves. Man, the pure part of him, is descended from a curve. Do not laugh, I mean that literally. I rose and searched for my hat. I'm dreadfully sorry for you, Calmer, as I said as I walked toward the door, but I don't intend to stay and listen to such gibberish. I'll send my physician to see you. He's an elderly, kindly chap, and he won't be offended if you tell him to go to the devil. But I hope you'll respect his advice. A week's rest in a good sanitarium should benefit you immeasurably. I heard him laughing as I descended the stairs, but his laughter was so utterly mirthless that it moved me to tears. Here's the second segment. When Calmers phoned the following morning, my first impulse was to hang up the receiver immediately. His request was so unusual and his voice was so wildly hysterical that I feared any further association with him would result in the impairment of my own sanity. But I could not doubt the genuineness of his misery. And when he broke down completely and I heard him sobbing over the wire, I decided to comply with his request. Sounds Very familiar. well worked at... <laughs> what? So that, so that part sounds familiar. Like I knew I should have never <laughs> talked to this person again, but they were crying on the telephone. <laughs> Very well, I will come over immediately and bring the plaster. <laughs> en route to Calmer's home, I stopped at a hardware store and purchased 20 pounds of plaster of ferrets. When I entered my friend's room, he was crouching by the window, watching the opposite wall out of eyes that were feverish with fright. When he saw me... When we, excuse me, when he saw me, he rose and seized the parcel containing the plaster with an avidity that amazed and horrified me. He had extruded all of the furniture in the room presented a desolate appearance. It is just conceivable that we can thwart them, he exclaimed, but we must work rapidly. Frank, there is a stepladder in the hall. Bring it here immediately and then fetch a pail of water. What for, I murmured. He turned sharply and there was a flush on his face. To mix the plaster, you fool, he cried. To mix the plaster that will save our bodies and souls from a contamination unmentionable. To mix the plaster that will save the world from... Frank, they must be kept out. Ooh, oh, I murmured. This is so great. It's the smell. Oh, he's trying... <laughs> the smell is going to get on you. Go ahead, Tracy. Like, I wonder if he actually, you know, hasn't changed his pants since he took those drugs. Yeah. Maybe that would explain... <laughs> <laughs> the smell of the hounds. Okay, so uh, who must be kept out? The hounds of Tindalos, he muttered. They can only reach us through angles. We must eliminate. We must eliminate all angles from this room. 
I shall plaster up all of the corners, all of the crevices. Good idea. We must make this room resemble the interior of a sphere. I knew that it would... Wait, how much plaster did he bring? 20 pounds. I don't know. Yeah, he brought a bucket and then they have to mix it with water, so... Me. Tracy, me and my girlfriend bought this awesome plaster that you make... And like you wrap it around stuff and then, uh, you know, like you can mold with it, you know, like you could wrap it around a, a balloon or a ball. It's kind of like fancy, like paper mache when you were a kid, only it's a plaster and it comes with some kind of wrapping. And it was sitting by the door as I'm loading up a little bla this little black bag I have with art supplies. And if it wouldn't like I knew it would offend her if I took it because we got it together, you know, like it's something we're going to do together. But I was like, oh, man, I could bring the plaster so just just so you know, that's kind of freaking me out. Like I almost brought the plaster myself. <laughs> you were thinking about it. Yeah. You should have brought the plaster. I'll, I'll order more. I'll order more. Actually, Jim and I have access to plaster. We we can. Let's let. How much for a kit of four ton? We'll put that on the Patreon too. Yeah. That's about Good 500, idea. Five hundred bucks. Maybe three hundred bucks. Oh, someone wants you to know that the Discord link in the description expired. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I will add a new one. Okay, so we have to make the room resemble the interior of a sphere. I knew that it would have been useless to argue with him. I fetched the step ladder. Calmers makes the plaster, and for three hours we labored. We filled in the four corners of the wall and the intersections of the floor and wall and the wall and ceiling, and we rounded the sharp angles of the window seat. I shall remain in this room until they return in time, he affirmed when our task was completed. When they discover that the scent leads through curves, they will return. They will return ravenous and snarling and unsatisfied to the foulness that was in the beginning, before time, beyond space. He nodded graciously and lit a, lit a cigarette. It was good of you to help, he said. Will you not see a physician, Calmers? I pleaded. Perhaps tomorrow, he, mur he murmured. But now I must watch and wait. Wait for what, I urged. Calmers smiley, smiled wanly. I know that you think me insane, he said. You have a shrewd but prosaic mind, and you cannot conceive of an entity that does not depend for its existence on force and matter. But did it ever occur to you, my friend, that force and matter are merely the barriers to perception imposed by time and space. When one knows, as I do, that time and space are identical and that they are both deceptive because they are merely imperfect, imperfect manifestations of a higher reality, one no longer seeks in the visible world for an explanation of the mystery and terror of being. I rose and walked toward the door. Forgive me, he cried. I did not mean to offend you. You have a superlative intellect, but I, I have a superhuman one. It was only natural that I should be aware of your limitations. <laughs> Phone me if you need me, I said, and descended the stairs two steps at a time. I'll send my physician over at once, I muttered to myself. He's a hopeless maniac, and heaven knows what will happen if someone doesn't take charge of him immediately. Here's the third segment. The following is a condensation of two announcements which appeared in the Partridgeville Gazette for July 3rd, 1928. The headline, Earth, Earthquake Shakes Financial District. At two o'clock in the morning, an earth tremor of unusual severity broke several plate glass windows in Central Square and completely disorganized the electric and street ra railway system. The tremor was felt in the outlying districts and the steeple of the First Baptist Church on Angel Street designed by Christopher Wren in 1717, was entirely demolished. Firemen are now attempting to put out a blaze which threatens to destroy the Partridgeville Glue Works. An investigation is promised by the mayor and an immediate attempt will be made to fix responsibility for this disastrous occurrence. Here's another headline. A cult writer murdered by unknown guest. <clears throat> Horrible crime in Central Square. Mystery surrounds death of Halpin Calmers. Oh, no. At 9 8. Halpin. 
At 9 a.m. today, the body of Help and Commerce author and journalist was found in an empty room above the jewelry store of Smithwich and Isaacs, 24 Central Square. The coroner's investigation revealed that the room had been rented, furnished to Mr. Calmers on May 1st, and that he had himself disposed of the furniture a, fort a fortnight ago. Calmers was the author of several recondite books on occult themes and a member of the Bibliographic Guild. He formerly resided in Brooklyn, New York. At 7 a.m., Mr. Ellie Hancock, who occupies the apartment opposite Calmer's room in the Smithwick and Isaacs establishment, smelt a peculiar odor when he opened his door to take in his cat in the morning edition of the Partridgeville Gazette. The odor he describes as extremely acrid and nauseous, and he affirms that it was so strong in the vicinity of Calmer's room that he was obliged to hold his nose when he approached the section, that section of the hall. He was about to return to his own apartment when it occurred to him that Calmers might have accidentally forgotten to turn off the gas in his kitchenette. Becoming considerably alarmed at the thought, he decided to investigate, and when repeated tappings on Calmers' door brought no response, he notified the superintendent. The latter opened the door by means of a pass key, and the two men quickly made their way into Calmers' room. The room was utterly destitute of furniture, and Hancock asserts that when he first glanced at the floor, at the floor his heart went cold within him, and that the superintendent, without saying a word, walked into the open window and stared at the building opposite for fully five minutes. Calmers lay stretched upon his back in the center of the room. He was starkly nude, and his chest and arms were covered with a peculiar bluish pus or ichor. His head lay grotesquely upon his chest. It had been completely severed from his body, and the features were twisted and torn and horribly mangled. Nowhere was there a trace of blood. The room presented a most astonishing appearance. The intersections of the walls, ceiling, and floor had been thickly smeared with plaster of Paris, but at intervals, fragments had cracked and fallen off, and someone had grouped these upon the floor about the murdered man so as to form a perfect triangle. Besides the body, there were several sheets of charred... Of what? I said he was in the middle of the angle. Yep. They made an angle to come get him. Sure did. Beside the body were several sheets of charred yellow paper. These bore fantastic ge geometric designs and symbols that severe that several hastily excuse me, I totally messed that up. These bore fantastic geometric designs and symbols and several hastily scrawled sentences. The sentences were almost illegible and so absurd in con In content, I think is what they meant. So absurd in content that they furnished no possible clue to the perpetrator of the crime. I am wa waiting and watching, Calmers wrote. I sit by the window and watch walls and ceiling. I do not believe that they can reach me, but I must beware of the duels. D-O-E-L-S. Perhaps they can help break through. Perhaps they can help them break through. The satyrs will help, and they can advance through the scarlet circles. The Greeks knew a way of preventing that. It is a great pity that we have forgotten so much. On another sheet of paper, the most badly charred of the seven or eight fragments found by Detective Sergeant Douglas of the Partridgeville Reserve was scrawled on the following. Was, on them was scrawled the following. Good God, the plaster is falling. A terrific, sh he's writing all this while he's dying. Okay. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> It's like how Mo Moses wrote the five books of Moses, supposedly, and he dies right before the end. I've, I've never understood that. Okay. Right before the Good end. God. <laughs> Good God, the plaster is falling. A terrific shock has loosened the plaster, and it is falling. An earthquake, perhaps. I could never have anticipated this. It is growing dark in the room. I must phone Frank. But he can, but can he get here in time? I will try. I will recite the Einstein formula. I will, God, they are breaking through. They are breaking through. Smoke is pouring from the, co he writes this. Smoke is pouring from the corners of the wall. Their tongues, ah!
<laughs> and the last word he wrote in his diary was, ah. <laughs> you guys are really lucky to be getting this for free. This is actually pretty close to plus ultra content. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. In the opinion of Detective Sar excuse me. <coughs> Detective Sergeant Douglas, Palmer's was poisoned by some obscure chemical. He was sent specimens of the strange blue slime found on Calmer's body to the Partridgeville Chemical Laboratories. And he expects the report will shed new light on one of the most mysterious crimes of recent years. That it's okay. Did they call the blue stuff i -Corp. Isn't that what you said? Yes, in the what was supposedly a newspaper article, but, I mean, it's not written like any newspaper article I've ever read. So. It made me wonder if that used to be a term for something other than, you know, I think of the golden blood of the gods. Right. You know? Uh, I think that's what it meant, but I think he's implying that it's being used just as an, a descriptive term yeah. as though everyone in the 1920s was familiar with that term, which would make sense if everyone had to learn Latin and everyone had to learn about Greek gods in yeah. high school. It makes me, makes me want to look up the study the etymology a bit. I, I don't know if I've ever, I've, I've got an etymology app and of course I've got, you know, piles of real dictionaries when I'm in my office and those kinds of things, but well, I don't, I don't know that you're going to find anything other than the blood of the Greek gods, because I remember looking it up and that it was, you know, that and not looking up the etymology of it per se, but looking up Icor, and that's the origin of it. And I think I remember them saying that they don't know, you know, what it means. Yeah, pus or oh. Icor, Jacob Bacchus, blue slime, basically. And uh, Snake Jones is asking for the author in the book. It's, um, I, I tried to memorize it, but I don't remember um, the story the story is called Hounds of Tendalos, T I N D A L O S. The author is Frank Belknap, B E L K N A P, Long, L O N G. Frank Belknap Long. And so this is a compilation that was printed in the 70s, I think, of, uh, of Cthulhu related stories. But I'm sure you can find it's probably been reprinted in other collections at this point. So, um, I'm almost done here. Let's see. Okay, so awe is where we left off, I think. Ah. <laughs> oh, wait, and the, there's the, the chemical, the blue slime sent to the chemical laboratory. And he expects the report will shed new light on one of the most mysterious crimes of recent years. That Calmers entertained a guest on the evening preceding the earthquake is certain, for his neighbor distinctly heard a low murmur of conversation in the former's room and he passed it on his way to the stairs. Suspicion points strongly to this unknown visitor and the police are diligently endeavoring to discover his identity. Here's the fourth section. Report of James Morton, chemist and bacteriologist. My dear Mr. Douglas, the fluid they sent to me, uh, the fluid sent to me for analysis is the most peculiar that I have ever examined. It resembles living protoplasm but it lacks the peculiar substances known as enzymes. Enzymes catalyze the chemical reactions occurring in living cells, and when the cell dies, they cause it to disintegrate by hydrolyzation. Without enzymes, protoplasm should possess enduring vitality, i.e. immortality. Enzy enzymes are the negative components, so to speak, of unicell unicellular organism, which is the basis of all life. That living matter can exist without enzymes, biologists emphatically deny. And yet the substance that you have sent me is alive, and it lacks these, quote, indispensable bodies. Good God, sir, do you realize what astounding new vistas this opens up? Here's the fifth section and the final section. Excerpt from The Secret Watcher by the late Halp and Calmers. What if, parallel to the life we know, there is another life that does not die, which lacks the elements that destroy our life? Perhaps in another dimension there is a different force from that which generates our life. Perhaps this force emits energy, or something similar to energy, which passes from the unknown dimension where it is and creates a new form of cell life in our dimension. No one knows that such new cell life does exist in our dimension. Ah, but it does, excuse me, Ah, 
but I have seen its manifestations. I have talked with them. In my room at night, I have talked with the Doels. And in dreams, I have seen their, mark, their maker. I have stood on the dim shore beyond time and matter and seen it. It moves through strange curves and outrageous angles. Someday, I shall travel in time and meet it face to face. The end. Wow. The Doles, like D-O-E-L-S, is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, we need to... We need to revivify the Doles. There's one. I need a drink here, and I need to somehow take a slight break. Oh, go ahead. But, we we yeah. can uh, we can totally uh, jump on here and BS for a second or whatever. Okay. I cool. Keep... I'm, I'm... Go ahead. There's probably things in the chat that uh, demand some attention. So yeah, yeah. Possible. I'm gonna turn this off for a minute. So go ahead. Yep. All right. Let me uh, jump back. Thank you, Tracy, for reading that entire story. Um, yeah, that was good. It was. I like that story. We, and plus, we can go clip that out and make it a standalone story of uh, Tracy Twyman reads the blue icor of the doles. Dole. Dot dot net. net. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. The blue, the blue icor of the doles. Dot dot net. <laughs> good. Yeah. See there? Your money's helping already, folks. We got effects on the microphone. <laughs> We bought that with the money you haven't even sent yet. <laughs> so I was going to go up here. Um, let's, just, uh, let's just make the chat big for just a second. Um, once again, thank you for joining us here on Picture Show number 40 where we're making art. I'm trying to complete a painting called Ozzy Osbourne, fully proselytized and fervently preaching the apocalypse. And Jim... I don't know how well you can see it, but Jim is over here sculpting away beautifully at the, uh, what I would call the first plate in the Baphomet Temple Mystery Unveiled by Tracy and Alex Rivera. And it's looking good. But yeah, I wanted to scroll through the chat. I'm going to make the chat a little bigger. We love you guys. We appreciate you being here with us. We are having a good time. And... Um, the only frustration I can express right now is that this picture is so big I need to walk that away and stand right in front of it and look. About 50 feet away from it. And I can't. I almost wish there was a huge mirror close to where we have the large monitor hanging. You can go through that door there. I, that's what you were trying to say. Yeah. Huh? yeah, cool, good idea. I can open the door and walk away. So, But yeah, let me. Uh, I'm going to scroll up here in the chat. Um, oh, I need to drop a new Discord link. I can do that or... You know, um, if I've private messaged anyone a link, um, any private message link is probably permanent in the chat. So, so Jim the Outrageous, huh? I'd like yeah. to get the, the backstory on that. Jim is his stripper name. Love Jim, Jim and the holograms. <laughs> this is good. We missed some good stuff. That's funny. What is Jim making? Well, I don't know. Do you want me to hold it up or... It's not, it's not done yet. Yeah, I would be very wary to hold it up because... Pretty soon, though, you guys will see it. So, um, you know, you can... I guess, uh, should we... We want to hold up the picture? Or let's just... I think but suspense better build. What yeah. What Jim is making is none of your business yet. <laughs> so, um... So what, what's all this gem stuff? I don't know. Should we try to get to the top That's of funny. the gem? This book is a real ray of sunshine... Seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all else will be added unto you. All that good shit. This this is uh, two books ago or three books ago, I think. Oh, okay. So yeah. Hey, a cult fan is here. Thank goodness. Oh, I wanted to tell everybody. I want to get your guys' opinion on something. Hold on. Oh yeah. I don't know. Can how. Can you guys see that right there? Let's see. I'm gonna wait for Jim. There, you can uh, look at look at the uh, live stream there. All right, that's about right. So, um, oh, I forgot I put a, a karate band on my head. Um, I personally think this kind of looks like a cult fan. Like, 
So I wanted to get like press one if you agree, press two if you think that I just got like I'm way out. But like to me, if if we get enough ones and we get a cult fan's permission, I might uh, complete this with him in mind as opposed to just completing it otherwise. So, oh, it looks like Tracy's back. And now I've never met to... a cult fan. Don't stop on my account. What were you talking about? Um, well, I the my other painting that I, uh, well, it was kind of like the side painting. Um, I'm sure I explained it on the other show that I kind of have a quirk. Like I can't really just let leftover paint just sit and dry. Um, so I always use it up. And when I did, I painted this one. And um, since then, every time I see it, it makes me think of a cult fan with his collar popped. And so I was asking. Uh, what do you mean, like his his Twitter uh, picture? No, like I mean, he posts he posts enough videos and pictures of himself that like he he has a, a nice white shirt that he wears sometimes with a checkerboard uh, scarf. Um, when he plays the guitar, he's got a little like thing on his wrist, like he used to wear like a knife fighting guard or something on your wrist when I first met you. It's kind of a similar thing, like a couple big bracelets or something. But uh, it makes me think of him. So I was trying to get everyone's opinion whether or not. Uh, yeah, Snake Jones is agreeing with me. I don't see any other ones or twos. Uh, that's a common thing, chat. Someone says one for this, two for that, and you got to push the button. That's the way it works. Yeah, and or, like, or don't. One for no, English, that, two for Spanish. It's not or don't. It's or do. Or do. <laughs> <laughs> so this, um, Jacob Backus just said something in the chat that he says he regretted, but I think it should be repeated. Okay. And it is that it, the gem sculptures sculptures look like the Steiner sculpture of Araman. Do you know what that is? Uh uh. So Rudolf Rudolf uh, Steiner did a sculpture of Araman. You know the bad guy in the Persian dichotomy. What do you call it? You know, there's Ahura Mazda and Araman. Yeah. What's that religion? Zoroastrianism. Uh, Say again? Zoroastrian. Yeah, Zoroastrian. That's what, yeah. So do well, you want to, we could, um, we could switch uh, views and try and throw it up on the screen real quick That'd if you guys cool. want to. Let's, let me get, cool. let me get back so to I, OBS here. Sorry. Shared con. No, go ahead, Tracy. Uh, yeah, I had been trying to figure out what it reminded me of, and that is it. Now, which sculpture? So, Araman. So... A H R I F M A N is the name of the character, and the artist is Rudolf Steiner. I'm gonna open my beer while you're doing that. Haraman. Haraman. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I see. Oh, I guess I need to. Uh, I need to get this into screen shareability here. Whoa. Cool. I didn't realize. I mean, it doesn't surprise me. I didn't realize that Rudolf Steiner was a sculptor too. He's um, he's he's like the master of the whole biodynamic farming thing. So we run into that being gardeners. My girlfriend and I, and Jim too. Jim is also a pretty avid at growing. Uh, He's like doing experiments with the uh, mason jars and hydroponics, herb with, gardens. Yeah, there's an awesome YouTube channel with a guy named Jeb Gardner, and Jim got inspired by the stuff Jeb does and has been like growing spinach and lettuce and herbs and stuff with no dirt, and it's pretty awesome. So It's fun. They grow really fast and thick. Yeah, like you can just get your scissors and have a salad. So I wonder if this is the... Okay, the, Actually, I need to be. I'm, I said it wrong now because Jacob's saying he meant the, the painting, not the sculpture. He meant SB's painting, not oh. Jim's sculpture. Oh, interesting. Although I, what, what I think is, yeah, I could see a little bit in both, actually. Oh, so the painting I held up and asked. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. The, the Bogdanov face and the Araman face definitely have some similarities I think there. These all, I think these all, well, I mean, the other thing is that picture was originally like a fast, 
a fast work of the Bogdanov because I was painting a meticulous and careful Bogdanov. So then when I was cleaning off the brush by using up the paint, it's like, okay, do the motions again without so much over concern for lines, you know, like rough it up and make it more abstract. So, and as I continue to work and add red, especially, it's like, well, now it's the devil, you know, like I always paint the Joker and the devil, whether I want to, or, or Jimi Hendrix, these three things just come out of my hand. If I'm not paying attention, that's what I end up with. Cause it's what I drew when I was in seventh grade, you know, I love the gestural <laughs> feel of that, of your, uh, that piece you just held up. Yeah. That, that um, piece is really more looseness and it is, that's my style, you know, me painting these other Bogdanovs is me trying to like desperately reach for something classic and traditional style and it's still really loose and sloppy by contrast to someone who's meticulous i'm not really well it's hard to copy something yeah i don't i don't have enough practice and my and i'm pretty rusty right now anyway to to truly be meticulous i mean but if i was gonna get a grade boy all of a sudden my lines would improve and you know like i wouldn't sweat or drip or smear on my canvas at all and <laughs> but isn't that funny how you know if you bet a dollar on a game of pool all of a sudden yeah. you can the pressure's on and you can stare at the cue ball different you know well if you're, if i was getting a grade i'd probably start over like 16 times yeah that's what i mean you yeah we'd be like, like oh crap like, oh i tried to draw the outline in pencil like, and, no, 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 and no, no, i no, went no, past no. the line and that means i would have to use yeah. the eraser so i'm gonna get a new piece of paper <laughs> even though this paper is five dollars each <laughs> yeah that's why when i draw gestures i draw like a thousand lines and i pick sort of the the line that i like the best out of all of them and that's what which one the one i decide is the is the right one and leave the rest i just kind of yeah you you actually taught me that like i'd never thought to like it in. Pre like i'm always just like thinking and sweating and waiting forever and like all right i got to do something really close to the eye or the teeth and it's like, screw it, here we go. Whereas, yeah. like, Jim said, no, like, go right underneath it on a pad or something and, like, practice just like you're going to hit a golf putt. And then, like, it works great. Like, I do that now, so thank you. This is the right picture, right, Jacob? Because this is, this is an interesting... I'm going to have to go and study Rudolf Steiner's pretty sculpture. Cool. Yeah. Steiner's an amazing genius man. I mean, I know there's people that think that, you know, like, according to Jan Irvin, he's just one more guy that was making this big plan to bring everybody down through Eros, but I don't know, man. Is I, that a I, bronze? I don't know if that is. It sure looks bronze down here, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, the way it shines. The, if you've ever heard of the Waldorf schools, that's all Steiner, too. I saw in the chat here going by that he started as a uh, theosophist and then graduated away from that. Um, a book I found recently that I eventually plan to read called Meditations on the Tarot definitely comes. I think that came after Steiner, but it's kind of affiliated into all of this too. So, Tracy, do you do art? Do you ever do you draw? Or I mean, obviously a extremely proficient writer, but is there any other categories we can plug you into? Uh, I've just I've been doing some meme art lately, but as far as visual art, well, I've done some you know, films too, but no, I don't, I cannot represent anything with my hands. I can't draw and I cannot sculpt. So, and I've tried and I, I really suck. Okay. My so mom still has some of my pieces though. Who does? My mother. Oh, you nice. Know, when, like art class from when yeah, I was Yeah, yeah, from school. They're terrible. Absolutely the worst. Yeah, we should, we should hit her up and buy those. No. <laughs> no, you can't do anything Very about it. We'll just do if we just send her enough money, she'll just send us the pictures. It's I'm tapping right now for the money to get Tracy's art secretly <laughs> behind her. Tap, 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 tap. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Tracy. I wouldn't do that to you. That's good. Yeah, the the worst. Well, it'd thing be like you playing a song I hate that I recorded or something. Like, oh, check this out. Sean said this is the worst he ever did, and then like, oh no, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I interrupted you. I'm sorry. You were going to say something. Oh, that's all right. It was not really all that great. I was going to say. So I have to find something else to read, huh? Well, you don't have to, but if, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of getting my flow going here. I, I, I think I'm going to oh, have yeah, to get great. away from the black oil pen and actually start to apply something to this thing, or it's going to be okay. another 15 years unfinished in the garage. <laughs> So are you guys making art oh, out in the chat there? Yeah, yeah, we definitely want an art update from the chat. Please, um, 
Make sure that you uh, share in the Discord. Let me go... Yeah. Uh, Do some doodle drawings. Did or we download Discord onto this machine or not? Some like sort of automatic writing style put doodle drawings or back really over good. here. Is this this view is probably okay, right? I love to doodle draw when I'm talking on the telephone. Oh yeah, no, I've got a I've got a secret doodle drawing from my very first in person conversation with the, uh, well I call him Boomstick McQuaid, but you might know him as Harrison. Um, when I. We very first talked, I was playing, I was rehearsing David Bowie and I realized the mic was playing it into the Discord. And so we jumped on and had like a cool little conversation. But while I was talking to him, I was uh, like my girlfriend had printed up a PowerPoint and one of the pages was like, you know, not needed or whatever. So I've been saving that and now I've been setting my coffee cup on top of it. Nice. So now it's getting coffee spilled on it. So my plan was to eventually finish that and send it to to Harrison if he wants it but hopefully you were drawing curves not angles it's ironically it's almost all angles I was oh. actually using a straight edge oh like, they're coming to get you well I know Harrison's scared of that kind of stuff so I figured ooga booga <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared of that kind of stuff oh Snake Jones is taking a break from the art tonight 10 hours a day of hard labor hey well God bless you man that's a lot of work yeah. I, I do not like the 10-hour days. We, we do that sometimes, too, though. But let me um let me know when you're ready, Tracy, and I think I'm going to try and get a new Discord link for folks here, too, so that uh, we can drop it in the chat. It's a good idea. Okay. I'm ready. I know it doesn't look ready like I'm ready because I'm not there yet, but here I am. So what I, my next piece here is Chapter 2 of... It's a book called Pornographic Archaeology. The author's name, sorry about that. Finally. The author's name is <laughs> Sharinka Tahuljak. Wow. So that is, that is uh, Z R I N K A. That's the first name. The second name, S T A H U L J A K. And she's. Um, a, a contemporary, you know, she she's has a, a class that she teaches at UCLA and uh, she's been doing some documentaries lately and stuff. So she's she's around, you know, you can probably get a hold of her if you really wanted to. And she's wrote, written some interesting things in this book, actually about a lot of different things. But this particular chapter is about genealogies. So, oh, I remember. Just, yeah, yeah, this is. This, this sounds, and now, do, would you tell us when it was published, please? Yeah, sure. And just to warn you, Sean, uh, SB, because I know that you complained, or I don't know if you would call it a complaint, but you noted when things that I was reading last episode where we were reading, you would uh, mention when something was dry. And I'm sure this is. So, it, you know, it's a university press book. Uh, 2013 is when it was published. University of Pennsylvania Press. It's just definitely written with, you know, scholar ease here. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I certainly don't have any, any problem with the uh, dry academic texts, especially this week after following up, like, the awesome Pulp Fiction that you just read, you know. <laughs> I mean. And, okay, so another thing, in addition to being dry and, you know, having big words and being wordy, it, it has the feature. I'm sorry, you're still talking. No, go ahead. Are you? No, no, that was the, <laughs> that was the keyboard making noise. Okay. Uh, has all these words, like college buzzwords, you know, things that just jump out at me. Um, I, I, I guess if if we come across any of them, then I'll then I'll make note of it. But. Like I'm saying, I like this author, and I, I think she's very smart and very interesting, so I'm not putting her down by noting this, but there's just certain things in there that only a modern, a, a person in modern academia would use these phrases. And one of her influences also that she seems to cite quite a lot is Michel Foucault. I don't Foucault, know if you've ever yeah, heard of okay, him. Foucault, yeah. Oh, they, is that they, how, how they pronounce it, Foucault? Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty okay. sure. I could be wrong, but um, Michel Foucault is like the the main um like 
Like, if there was a bus going by, that's the postmodernist that Jordan Peterson would want to throw under there the most, I think. I could be wrong, though. <laughs> if anything, we could count on uh, Harrison to correct me, because I'm sure he would know. So, but yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Sounds like she's of that ilk. Yeah, I would. it seems like she's very influenced by him. Yeah, and that's the guy, I, I mean, I don't know what all he wrote about, but he... But as far as like his personal life, I remember you know it was all he was like this guy that uh, needed to go into hardcore S gay S and M in order to I don't know it, it had something to do with his existential angst it, it seemed to me <laughs> no you're not that's that's just it we're talking about critical theory folks can you tell <laughs> so this this chapter is called pathologic genealogy biological heredity and medieval kinship and. There's, okay, just, there's a bunch of words on each page. The type is very small, so I can't really say how how deep I'm going to get into this and if I'm if we're going to get to the point of the chapter here before I, you know, if, yeah, if, if I might peter out here. Yeah, we, 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 <laughs> tr we'll we trust you. <laughs> we'll see how far I can get. From the entirety of our study, the role of the doctor emerges then in all of its importance. Knowing the heredity, no, excuse, knowing the hereditary antecedents of his clients, he will be able to foresee what their children will be. In his perspective, the adage, pater est quim morbi filiorum demonstrant, will offer many more guarantees than the famous saying of Roman law, pater est quim nuptiae demonstrant. These words, written by Dr. Fernand de, de Brett, or de Bray, in his 1901 doctoral thesis, La Selection Naturelle dans l'espèce humaine, synthesized the major conceptual and intellectual shift in the conceptualization of genealogy that occurred under the influence of medical discourse on hereditarianism. The identity between the children's and father's disease confirms alone the father's biological paternity. Marriage in and of itself cannot prove the blood relation of the father to his offspring. It merely establishes his juridical recognition of and responsibility for them. If before the naturalization and medicalization of heredity in the earlier part of the 19th century, see chapter one, filiation had depended on marriage law. A husband is necessarily the father of the child since the marriage bond carries an implicit paternal recognition of his offspring. Once medicine theorized heredity, filiation was defined by biology. Medical discourse on heredity introduced a difference between biological paternity, natural law, cognatio, parente naturale, and juridical paternity, civil law, agnatio, parente civile, or civile. Uh, <laughs> the biological father is the one designated by the hereditary diseases of his offspring while the father by law is the one designated by marriage. Juridical and medical paternity were now two separate paradigms, subjects of two distinct discourses of law and medicine. In addition to the demarcation of the juridical, for, of the juridical from biological paternity and filiation, medical discourse also transformed kinship and consanguinity from juridical to a biological notion. After having belonged exclusively Quote, after having belonged exclusively to juridical language, the word consanguinity was adopted by doctors who made it into the synonym of kinship, unquote. Kinship now referred to, a blood, to blood relatives, quote, the kinship of individuals born of the same trunk, and consanguinity meant direct blood descent, quote, coming in direct descent from a common genitor, consanguin relatives are attached to the same family by blood relation, unquote. But prior to this definitive conceptual shift of the mid 19th century, consanguinity had a juridical and social meaning tied to the institution of marriage. It identified and restricted eligible marriage partners. Marriage partners were defined by proximity, that is degrees of kinship. While ancient societies allowed marriage among even directly related blood kin, after the advent of Christianity, an extended notion of proximity restricted marriage eligibility. 
a juridical definition of consanguinity was the heritage of the ecclesiastical Middle Ages and the Lateran Council of 1215. Antoine Furetaire's Dictionnaire Universel, 1690, still used the medieval definition of consanguinity by degrees of proximity among kin who were not eligible to marry. Quote, marriage is forbidden by the church up through and including the fourth degree of consanguinity, but it is not an obstacle to marriage according to the law of nature, except in direct lineage. Consanguinity ends at the sixth or seventh degree, except for the crown, in which case it carries on to infinity. A broad notion of proximity made all who were kin, whether by blood, biologically, consanguinitas, or by alliance, non-biologically, and or spiritually, affinitas, in-laws, and godparents, linked metaphorically by the concept of blood. This word, consanguinity, is also used in a more general way to denote all kinds of kinship. Medieval genealogies were thus not always reliable since their members may or may not have been blood descendants of their ancestors. Consanguinity was malleable and its capacity to designate blood kin as well as in-laws and godparents <coughs> exposes the powerful rhetoric of blood kinship as precisely as a discursive effect, subject to redefinitions by jurisprudence. In the 17th century, as seen, consanguinity was still a juridical concept that was subject to social convention and canonical prescription. But by the mid 18th century, the juridical concept of consanguinity as proximity began to weaken. Then began an in increase of endogamy and alliances that have previously been considered incestuous. With the brother's widow, first cousin, or a niece, became acceptable in urban and rural milieus by the mid 19th century. The erosion of the juridical meaning of consanguinity meant that proximity was now increasingly defined in narrower terms of nuclear family, that is, those most directly linked by blood. This coincided with the emergence of the notion of species. It was understood that the reproductive power of individuals made the species. The focus on reproduction began to transform the metaphorical relationship between family and state of the ancient regime into a biological one of disciplinary biopower over the population. Or, yeah. Thus, the epistemic space of heredity and consanguinity as organic reproduction and not succession or proximity in juridical terms could also emerge. In the mid-19th century, 1856 to 1866, the debate on consanguinity and its role in heredity sealed the notion of consanguinity as biological and finalized the linguistic and conceptual shift from kinship to blood kinship, from lineage to bloodline, from blood metaphor, proximity among kin, to biological materialism, blood kin. This difference between juridical and medical conceptualizations of consanguinity split the notion of kinship in a radical way between old genealogies established on the basis of marriages that guaranteed filiation through the juridical, that is potentially affiliative and fictional bond, bond and modern genealogies identified as a bloodline of heredity hereditary characteristics that is biological and objective. Consequently, the meaning of genealogy was altered from lineage as proximity, juridical, to lineage as bloodline, biological. At this critical juncture of the 19th century, of the mid-19th century, medieval and ancient regime genealogies provided the documentary evidence of the long durée that medicine needed to theorize the problem of morbid heredity and consanguinity. Conversely, medical dis courses impacted our modern understanding of these medieval genealogies. Quote, blood had been a genealogical concept in the French Middle Ages, denoting both juridical affiliation and biological bloodline. But 19th century hereditarianism and the consanguinity debate narrowed its semantic field exclusively to a naturalized medical concept of biological bloodline. Whereas genealogies in the Middle Ages had a juridical function, under the influence of 19th century medical theories of hereditary transmission by the blood, we have since understood medieval genealogies in narrower quasi-medical terms as biological bloodlines. This has had a long-lasting effect on the disciplines of history and literary history and on their analytical models of the medieval family, kinship, and the disposition and structure of medieval history, time, and narration. 
It is the aim of this chapter then to show how heredity as a medical, that is scientific idea, gained cultural ascendancy and ultimately was translated into medieval disciplinarity and a disciplinary logic that could produce a biological reading of medieval genealogies. By the 1850s, blood was undoubtedly a medical concept. On the one hand, the subject of hematology, on the other, the carrier of biological heredity. Blood signified the fluid circulating in the body of an individual and the organic substance that transmitted the same physiological form from generation to generation, giving conformity to a species. In other words, blood was no longer a metaphor, a rhetorical device whose discursive effect was to establish ties of kinship regardless of biology, but an organic matter and medical term. A materiologist, biological con a, excuse me, a material biological concept of blood replaced by the re replaced the rhetorical and juridical ju 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 dash social function that blood had held in the Middle Ages and the ancient regime. The consequentity debate essentialized the concept of blood as a fluid circulating in individual bodies and substance creating biological lineages. The blood is the breeding ground of races. It is the cement of the organism. That's a quote from somebody. I'm not going to look it up. So, you know, it's a, it's a footnote, and I'd have to look it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, circ <laughs> the circulation of blood holds together the organism of an individual because of, quote, the considerable role played by nourishing fluid in organic renovation, unquote. Blood is also the seed from which a lineage, the, quote, race, la race, grows and expands. Quote, blood is this grounding of generations. Unquote. Both in its individual physiological organism and collective genealogical race role, blood is a medicalized concept. In each case, in circulating in the organism or in the race, it performs this double mission of blood. It is from the blood that are derived the materials which repair, which heal wounds. It is also there that are found the materials which fortify. Blood's double mission is either to, quote, repair and, quote, heal morbid heredity and stop degeneration, or to strengthen what is already healthy, to, quote, fortify. But this double mission is undermined in the individual. Quote, if the blood is infected by any particular virus, then the seminal matter will also, will also be infected, and as a result, the germ will share in the dominant virus of the father, unquote. Consequently, blood can generate as much as can regenerate as much as contaminate a lineage. The quote race. Quote, a head of family glorifies the superiority of his race when he speaks of the beauty of his blood. He sees it degenerate when the blood alters in it. Unquote. In consequent marriages, especially, quote, we accuse alliances between parents of the same lineage of bringing on, of creating by the mere fact of the non-renewal of the blood, a special cause of organic degeneration, fatal to the propagation of the species. Bad blood is the cause of extinction of lineages. Medical discourses on consequentity and heredi heredity also naturalized representations of family lineage, genealogies. Genealogies were an important tool of historical analysis. Quote, beyond that they serve to distinguish historical figures of the same name and same family, they reveal the ties of kinship, succession, the rights, claims, unquote. But this instrument of historical research was now an object of medical intervention when hereditary and, or excuse me, when heredity and husbandry of the race played a major role. Articles on genealogy and heredity in Pierre LaRousse's Grand Dictionnaire Universal do 19 siècle are a prime example of how medicine reduced genealogy to heredity and put it to use for eugenics. The article on heredity adopts the general idea espoused by anti, excuse me, anti -cons consanguinous that inbreeding causes degeneration of a family. Quote, families that procreate among themselves degenerate and bastardize without delay, unquote. And that an absence of crossbreeding between the weak and the strong only leads to further deterioration. 
quote, the union of two individuals with poor constitutions gives birth to children who are weaker and more dim-witted, unquote. It is logical that what it is logical then that neither intermarriage nor unions between degenerates can, quote, be advised. On the contrary, it is necessary to renew constitution and temperament through well-reasoned crossbreeding, unquote. The only way to arrive at, quote, well-reasoned regenerative crossbreeding is by the cons constitution and consultation of genealogies. LaRousse gives here the example of animal breeding. LaRousse's article calls for, quote, the determination of genealogies for each race. That is, quote, a, ge a genealogical book, the equivalent of a, quote, civil status of individuals. And he laments that the civil status has been under underused. This institution remains sterile in respect to maintaining and perfecting the races because man, who claims to be intelligent, is too proud, too infatuated with his individual freedom to apply himself to apply to himself the principles of animal husbandry, which should regulate all procreation. <laughs> the Eugenics number much? of book <laughs> what? Is it eugenics much? <laughs> <laughs> the number of books on the medicine of history also used medieval and ancient regime genealogies, most often dynastic, as raw material for the medical study of heredity. The first impetus to genealogical medical studies was given in 1846 at the dawn of the consequinity debate by Louis-Francois Benoiston de Chateauneuf, who studied genealogies of 300 noble families over the course of five centuries in his memoir, Sir de, memoir sur la jury des families nobles in France. Alfred Bourgeois followed suit in 1859 with the study of 68 consequent unions in one family over 130 years. Dr. Auguste Corlew can be credited with signaling and exploring what would become of the most, excuse me, what would become the most fruitful area of the medicine of history, French royal dynasty. In 1872, in his La Médecine de l'Histoire Etude Médicale sur la Dynastie de Valois, Corleu set the example by showing, quote, for the House of Valois, the irrefutable application of the great laws of general pathology. We indeed see a head of lineage, Francis I, whose fecundity was never in doubt, unable to conserve the throne of his family for more than 74 years, unquote. At about the same time, in 1873, Diodule Ribot published La Heredité Psychologique. From the medieval period, Ribot picked only Carolingians, but his examples diversify for the ancient regime to include the Medici family with Charles Quint and the Royal House of Spain distinguished families such as the Conde and the Guises, but also statesmen, Pitt, Walpole. In 1881, Dr. Paul Jacoby published a widely read and contested book, Les Etudes sur la Selection dans ses rapports avec la Heredité chez l'homme, in which he made, quote, made genial made genealogy into a subsidiary of pathology, unquote. His preference was for the genealogy of the House of Valois from the 14th to the 18th century, quote, earlier, area, earlier eras not being well enough known in regards to genealogies. That's interesting. In Jacoby's footsteps followed Jules Dejerine, who in La Heredité dans les maladies du système nerveux, 1886, published, quote, 70, geneal 70 genealogical tables, unquote, with a portion dedicated to dynastic genealogies, in particular the Royal House of Spain from 1440 to 1700. In 1888, Alexandre Couler reviewed the royal dynasties of Spain, England, and France over four centuries, <coughs> starting from the premise that, quote, the history of insanity is the very history of civilization. Unquote. Mm -hmm. Emile de, St de Solier, a student of Alexandre Lacazian, 
and published in 1895 his thesis, Psychology de Dernier Valois, in order to show, quote, the influence of weighty heredita heredity and a poor education on the mental state of these three sovereigns, unquote. They had been judged with severity, he argued, when they should be, quote, far more worthy of our pity, by which I mean the pity of doctors, unquote. But the reason behind the harsh judgment of history is that, quote, we have not looked for the secret of their degeneration in the far past of their antecedents and in their ill-fated birth, unquote. On the tail end of the medical obsession with genealogical study is Dr. Victor Galipe's 1905 study, La Heredite de Stigmate de Degenerense et le Family or Famille Sovereign. His argument on the Habsburg dynasty's, quote, sign of degeneration, Stigmate de la Degenerense. Okay, and then there's this English word, prog prognathism. And I don't know what that means, but I'm guessing it has something to do with their noses, because that's what I remember about the, the Habsburgs. They had a really weird-looking nose. Yeah, I uh, remember that. <laughs> this is a, I think Tracy's just showing off. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm, I'm just kidding, Tracy. I'm just joking. This is, I'm uh, not. I'm with you. And it makes me think, of course, immediately of the new chronology work. Because it's like, so this person's like casting doubt on all of genealogy now, too. Didn't, didn't they yes. have prominent jaws also? The Hap Habsburg jaw? What they used they, to call it? A really I, weak jaw? Was that what it was? No, it was like a prominent jaw. Okay, no, that's Hap right. It was Habsburg the Rothschilds that have a really weak jaw. Weak jaw. Okay. More prominent, Great. yeah, Krista says. Oh, anyway, so that's the uh, that's the deformity that I assume they're talking about here. Is it about the, uh, the nose or the jaw? I think it's the nose. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought you said. So go right ahead. So they're officially calling it, they have a French term for it, the sign of degeneration of the Habsburgs. And the English term for it apparently is prognathism, and I don't know what that means. But, okay, so anyway, uh, his argument about that, he being Dr. Victor Galipe, uh, was constructed entirely on genealogies. Quote, reading the genealogies of sovereign families may have seemed dull, but they constitute, along with portraits, the very basis of our demonstration, allowing us to identify the exact affiliations of the historical figure represented and to show, despite that we lack the portrait of his ancestors, the preservation across the ages of a hereditary familial type or its resurgence, unquote. In Galipe's case, genealogy justified physiognomy and physiognomy, in turn, was proof of biological bloodlines. Finally, work of another disciple of Alexandre Lacazny. Sorry, I thought for a minute I thought my cat was puking again, and I was just thinking, like, what, what about me doing this at home makes the cat puke? She doesn't <laughs> wait, normally wait, wait, puke. So, so we're getting some discreet information there. So, you, one of the times you ran away, it was to manage cat vomit. That was, yeah, actually, I even mentioned it on the last show, that the cat was puking on my bed. Oh, okay. I remember, yes. I thought you were talking about, again, this time already, because I know you went up and, like, went and re-secured your door, and then after that, you kept glancing to the right a couple times, and then you still walked off, so I was like, did the cat really already puke twice? That's what I thought you meant. Sorry. No, that was the other uncontrollable entity in the house right now. <laughs> Coming through the doors. <laughs> throwing money. And, yeah, Tina's throwing money. The, the cat seems to be holding her breakfast right now, so, so that's good for her dinner. Keep that stuff inside, dude. It sounds so romantic when you say uncontrollable entity throwing money. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, what, what was this? Uh, Saint, Saint Nicholas throws money at you from, from the roof, remember? Yeah. <laughs> so that's what that's what my kid was doing just pretending to be Santa Claus okay uh, so oh another disciple of Alexandre Kasagni Kasagni uh, Dr. Cabanze or Dr. Cabani on the Habsburgs and Bourbons of Spain served as a belated homage to 19th century genealogical dash hereditary thought. All these voluminous studies used 
historical genealogies to show the harmful effects of consanguinity in the effort to regulate the social practices of the French nation. Quote, it follows that in many cases, consanguine unions will be harmful and all the more dangerous given that morbid, morbid predispositions common to both spouses will be more marked, unquote. But they also comment on a connection between gene genealogy and politics, dynasty and national government since they serve as a powerful anti-royalist argument. Quote, had it always been thus, France would perhaps not have had to so, not have had so to suffer under the administration of degenerate races and patho pathological heredity is in my opinion, one of the most powerful arguments against dynastic heredity, unquote. Medical study of historical genealogies was the best political argument against the possibility of the return of the French royal family to power in Republican France. Doctors were thus putting new scientific methods in the service of providing medical evidence for the claims about the decadence of the ruling classes long suggested by moralists and political opponents of hereditary regimes. A book by Auguste Brachet, or Brackett, a philologist, linguist, and disciple of Emile Littre was no exception to this genealogical-medical rule. Begun in 1880, originally published in 1896, Pathology Mentale de Roy de France rejected the study of individuals, the great men or, quote, representative men that Moreau de Tour attempted in his La Psychology, like, <clears throat> La Psych, <laughs> for God's sake, La Psychology Morbid Dans Se Rapport avec la Philosophie de l'Histoire. <laughs> Rather, Auguste Brackett argued, entire dynasties have to be painstakingly brought in as evidence. Pathologies need to be considered within the longue durée perspective of genealogical trees. That no individual case considered in isolation and compared to an annual plant can provide, uh, oh, can provide, okay. Quote, how could an, impa how could an inpatient at Charenton a simple annual plant be compared with a lunatic like Charles VI, whose heredity can be traced back 600 years through a direct line of 18 generations, not to transform them into as many insane rulers in the house of France as historians might do in some Michelet inspired way, but to see through what gradual morbid alterations they passed and how the accumulation of morbid defects either alone or through consequent marriages, ultimately led to one lunatic, unquote. Thanks to dynastic heredity, one can study medical heredity. One can study medical heredity. In other words, hereditary defects must be studied genealogically as a, quote, pathologic genealogy. Brackett's book was entirely dedicated to the medieval period. He applied, quote, genealogies of blood relations to Louis XI's ascendancy and he was especially interested in Charles VI's madness. Historians had focused on, quote, various accidents to account for Charles VI's madness. Some attributed it to the overindulgence in tournaments and festivities, others to his sickly childhood. Michelet to an equestrian race that never took place, unquote. But the answer, says Brackett, lies in biology and more particularly in consanguinity, quote, any degeneration of a race can only be the result of heredity. And one of the most important factors in heredity is precisely the parent's consequentity, unquote. The geneal genealogical method of studying heredity and consequentity in particular reached its apex in Brackett's historical pathology. Brackett studied heredity and consequentity in 22 generations over 600 years. For him, this constituted overwhelming evidence in favor of the soundness of genealogy as an instrument of medical analysis. Nevertheless, Brackett resisted one subsidiary of medical genealogical study, the claim that dynasties and aristocracies were a privileged site of degeneracy, resoundingly articulated by Jacobi. Quote, all upper classes, all families that occupy exclusively elevated positions share the fate of reigning families, although to a lesser extent, 
always in direct relationship to the height of their privileges and their social position, unquote. For followers of Jacobi, hereditary transmission of power morphed into pathological heredity. Quote, Caesaritis, quote, the delirium power, quote, the, de the degenerative influence of power led to inevitably to de degeneracy and extinction. Quote, the greater it, the power, is, the greater the evidence of the moral, intellectual, and physical decadence, unquote. And, quote, absolute power produces the deepest and most rapid degeneration, unquote. But, Brackett asked, are we to locate in dynasties a particular type of de degeneracy? Do they constitute a legitimate isolated object of study, and should they be studied in isolation? Is there any inherent... Is there anything inherent to power that predisposed dynasties to degeneration? And moreover, is this degeneracy proof of royalty? <laughs> how, quote, how could we go so far as to affirm that degeneration is proof of royal origins? Unquote. Brackett demonstrates that dynasties are as susceptible to degeneracy as any other lineage, and that, indeed, the only difference lies in the quality and thoroughness of available documentation. Quote, royal dynasties offer the clinician the most precious sources of pathological documentation, unquote. But there is no excuse for any doctor who, quote, studying royal families and not having others at his disposition for scientific research maintains that there are mental illnesses with royal causes, unquote. Because there's nothing to which to assign the specificity, the specificity of, quote, the royalty of Louis XI's zoophilia, uh -huh. unquote. <laughs> quote, every degeneration, every degeneration of a race can be only the result of one heredity, unquote. Degeneration is not exclusive to royal families. In Brackett's view, a member of any lineage, nobleman or noblewoman and commoner can be the victim of hereditary degeneracy. Bracket thus relativizes the importance of genealogies to make them not into the carrier of truths about dynasties and their royal degeneracy, but a tool for understanding medical laws of heredity. Quote, historical pathology connects pathological pieces of data that it receives in fragments from medical history in order to establish their succession and to draw from them the pathological law of the individual, or as they say in clinics, the patient's pathogenic and hence mental formula. Unquote. In this process, historical pathology transforms historical genealogies into medical genealogies of pathology, but it also democ democratizes dynastic genealogies, making them equal to any other, quote, individual pathology of a community of individuals, unquote. In that, pathology mentale de Roy de France was an, quote, attempt to constitute a partial science from human heredity, unquote one that was judged as equal to, quote, a revolution in history. I'm going to see how, how much longer this goes on. Never mind. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll keep reading for a little while here. Next section is called The End of Genealogical Fictions. The medicalization of genealogies had its benefits for the discipline of history as well. In the absence of paternity tests, 19th century doctors and historians could use morbus morbid heredity to prove paternity, pater est quim morbi filiorum demonstrant. Evidence of patholog pathological heredity could serve as evidence of a bloodline or biological filiation and provide a corrective to genealogical fictions. Before biology, historical genealogies rested upon, quote, the belief in paternity, meaning upon an act of faith, unquote which in turn provided the foundation for, quote, European families. Paternity operated on a discursive act of recognizing oneself as the father of a child, an act grounded in the legal bond of marriage. Pater est quim nuptiae demonstrant. This discursiveness and malleability of ju juridical convention created the very fantasy of ancient regime genealogies that made the author of LaRusse's article on genealogy dismiss them. Quote, we must be on, on guard against preposterous claims by certain historians who, out of adulation, trace back to the heroic times the origins of the houses or the princes in whose favor they are writing. Unquote. 
Patrilinear continuity was a fictional construct. Quote, we see that noble families and above all those that date their origins back to far reaching eras have man managed up through the present to continue not their lineage, but their name far older for most of them than their descent only through the aid of all sorts of fictions and by grafting their names onto different families, unquote. To perpetuate their lineage, all means were good for families, quote, infinitely multiplied substitutions, quote, marriages successively contracted two, three, and four times, quote, requests for annulment of vows, quote, transfer of names by women in different families, etc. To the final desperate solution, quote, the legitimiz legitimizing of a natural child, unquote. But Bracket underscores the fundamental difference that, quote, in political history, whether a king is the son of the man believed to be his father or not, if no one other than his mother knows, then politics follows its course, unquote. If this uncertainty, quote, suffices for the historian, it is insufficient for the clinician, unquote. Quote, in pathology, the maxim pater est quem nuptiae demonstrant has no currency since the conclusions to be reached from the sequence and succession of facts rest entirely before any study on the fundamental premise that the sovereigns to be studied indeed descend from one another." Unquote. A major shift in the historical and cultural understanding of lineage has occurred. Paternity was no longer, quote, an act of faith, unquote, a legal convention or a construct of discourse, but a biological given, formulative of a bloodline. Quote, the basis, the premise of this study is necessarily the reality of heredity, unquote. Thus, if Brackett could not prove the biological paternity within Louis XI's royal dynasty, the entire study of his heredity was compromised. Quote, since the study of heredity is essentially based on the premise of biological certainty, every experiment on heredity is nullified as soon as one of the factors does not surely belong to the genealogical chain, unquote. Brackett circumvented the problem of uncertain biological paternity in an inventive and original way, quote, through knowledge of his hereditary, of his heredity, absolutely neglected until now by historians and doctors, unquote. Charles VI maternal line. Okay. So uh, Louis, this, Louis XI's psychological troubles are in no way proof of his direct descent from Charles VI. If we take into account the notoriety of Isabeau's adultery, the statement that, quote, any son of an insane father must be insane, unquote, means that his father could have been, quote, <laughs> Charles VI, Louis d'Orleans, Isabeau's lover, or an unknown man, unquote. But regardless, regardless of who was the genitor, Charles, Louis, or a, quote, commoner, quote, Isabeau's biological formula allows us to affirm that whoever the father was, this formula is, or this formula was in and of itself sufficient to explain the defects in Charles the seventh and Louis the eleventh. I think she meant to say sixth, right? Because they were talking about Charles the sixth. Yeah, I think you're right. All right, Charles the sixth or seventh and Louis the eleventh. That is, the maternal line itself was saturated with enough morbid heredity to produce hereditary defects of two kings. Hmm. Every sig single author of genealogical tables, except for Brackett, neglected the mother's heredity as central to the bloodline, and thus conflated genealogy not only with heredity, but also with patrilineal heredity. The passage from Benoiston de Chateauneuf's description of genealogical fictions to Brackett's medical use of genealogies marks the moment when blood was inscribed in, quote, physiological genealogy. Quote, historical pathology is properly speaking the explanation through biological science of the data furnished by historical texts, unquote. Brackett's study shows us how history turns into biology, how the legal bond of filiation turns into a bloodline. Historical study from then on would no longer speculate on paternity and filiation as a question of faith, but had to accept the idea of genealogy as a bloodline. Furthermore, since historical pathology could only use, quote, the negative biography in the history of an individual, meaning it could only admit the existence of verified facts, it would establish with exactitude and scientific rigor 
the bloodline of dynasties. Finally, Brackett's study also shows us that doctors, just like historians before them, focused exclusively on the paternal side of families and neglected the maternal line. The confusion of genealogy and heredity resulted in the naturalization of blood and patrilineal genealogy. Genealogy's primary signification was no longer based on faith and marriage law, but on blood descent, whereby heredity put an end to medieval genealogical fictions and replaced them with other fictions. What different genealogical strategies had protected the aristocracy from failures in the bloodline? If blood could not certify biological filiation, its metaphor, its metaphor could give a fictional continuity to the, to the line. The 19th century family no longer had this luxury of resorting to hereditary fictions because heredity, unlike the inheritance, could not be cheated with fictions. Genealogy, the very mechanism and mode of representation that organized, maintained, and represented the ancient regime, was adopted and transformed to suit the purposes of the medical core in studying an individual's heredity, on the one hand, to determine hereditary predispositions and causes, and on the other hand, to draw lessons from the body politic of dynasties and apply them to the body of the French nation. Paradoxically, then, genealogy did not die out as a relic of a bygone, bygone era. Rather, it was resuscitated and rearticulated in the medical biological discourse of eugenics surrounding the family and nation. Take a brief break here. So, wouldn't you say all of this is contradicting the traditional... Um... Chronology? Well, yeah, that for sure. I mean, that's, I say I see these as definitely going hand in hand with that, but also that it, uh, it's directly in contradiction of the way that people always claim Jewish heredity is always matrilineally. It's your mother if you're claiming to have Jewish DNA or lineage, and they're saying that they ignored all the mothers and only paid attention to the fathers. I mean. I, I mean, I know we all know that's true as far as, like, you know, if you go, what was it, Marie Antoinette having babies, and if a little girl comes out, then everybody's, oh, big sigh, and, you know, gives up, whereas the room was suffocated prior with everyone waiting to see if it's a son. But, yeah, I just... I kind of have a sidebar here. There's, there's some drama going on in the chat. Um, apparently, we've got some YouTube... YouTube drama, YouTube's shadow banning comments. Um, in our chat? In our chat, yeah. Jacob Bach has got uh, blocked from uh, commenting for a little while. Um, he said, uh, what did he say here? Foucault is a huge post structuralist, post modernist child sex advocate. And they, they, they totally blocked that. And then they weren't letting anybody say the word pedophile with a name in front of it. They were blocking those comments, too. Um, wow, this, so this probably has to do with the Elsa Gate crap, huh? That's, that's kind of what they were thinking. Because did you see that in the press, Tracy, that um, Disney pulled all their ads from YouTube? I, I saw the headline. I didn't um, read an article either. I didn't, I didn't read an article. But, um, boy, that sure sounds like it's, uh, once again, they're, we're, they're frog, watching. we're frogs being boiled. The robots are watching and making sure that we uh, abide by Big Brother and Big Sister and Big Mother's wishes. Well, we're not allowed to talk about Michel Foucault and his... Proclivities? Style sex. Yeah, I mean, that's where I learned about him, actually, was on YouTube. So anyway, yeah, they're they're uh, editing our uh, our chat. It makes you wonder if uh, and they, I mean, obviously if they can do that with the chat, then they can tell the AI robots to hear what we're saying too. So it's funny. Yes. It's like it works so good to self. If they, so this is I would use the word governance as opposed to government, but that's what they want. They want. Governance is self-government, so that's why you see so much shame and so much rallying. Part of it is that people have a good herd mentality, so if everyone comes out and says, you know, orange man bad, or whatever the example you want to use might be, 
um, people do follow along, but at the same time, it's a strategy to get everyone to practice governing themselves, you know? And I yeah. It makes me afraid to say the word pedophile, but they're going to kill our stream. Yeah, it sucks. We got to get the That's simulcast of the server going so that when and if they do anything like that, we can say, well, we'll see you on Tracy's server. We'll be there. We might even say pedophile. <laughs> Look, it's not some kind of secret, nor do you have to read any of his works or read deeply anything about him before you find that out. I remember the, the, um, the documentary I watched about it on YouTube about him. It was just his, you know, life story. It was a biography. It had quite a lot of views. It was a very popular channel that did biographies of philosophers. So this, I guess my point in bringing this up is just like, we could play this video right now. I'm not suggesting you do, but like we could, and then it would just say all the things that they were talking about in the chat. And, you know, are they going to censor that? You know, because it's all, <laughs> I, I guess the only difference between that video and this, and what's saying, what's being said in the chat is just the intent in the context, like in the chat, you're making a point specifically about that. Whereas, uh, in the in the the biography that I watched, it's just matter of factly stated as you know, part of his life story. So yeah, it's just yeah. that they can and just that it, it might actually jump out at somebody that makes it dangerous. And we're uh, propagating uh, c conjecture about it. You know, people are talking about it in the chat. I mean, if they if I mention it in a video, it's it's just kind of here and there, and it's... Well, yeah. my, my guess, too, is that, so, as much as people want to act like it's a free speech and or um, anti-conspiracy thing, you know, you, in my opinion, you do have to look at it more like uh, it's an advertising thing. So, they're trying to get a handle on the idea that everybody's ads are being aligned with all kinds of topics that they would assume not be affiliated with and you know so I get that you know you're trying to advertise your thing I'm not saying I agree with it but I understand you know, you're trying to advertise your thing you're getting a lot of views and when you go to try and look at the data of who's viewing it you notice that like oh we're getting lots of views and not very many sales and it's all on 9-11 videos or it's all on I hate you videos or it's all on Aliens from outer space are actually... Blue chickens. Yeah, well, yeah, and they're doing something bad. And so then you're like, well, I want to take my money off of that area and put it over here where I think people will buy. So I think it's it's both. You know, I don't, I don't think they're so much worried about conspiracy info getting out as much as they're worried that they're not able to pitch their advertising sales... Their, their, their sales teams aren't able to give as effective of a pitch once you get to the minutia, I think. So then if Disney says, we're pulling our money, then they ramp up the keywords to avoid or to ban or to block. They're trying to like probably like kiss the ring for Disney since they just lost all that money. Like, oh crap, we'll block the word pedophile, ramp it up to, uh, to the millionth degree so that... Uh, you know, we can, you know, like, get down on our knees and beg for Disney to put some money back or something. Obviously, well, I'm just speculating. Go ahead, Tracy. Yeah, it's just, this would be an interesting test. I'm sure it's going to continue. Other other companies are going to start doing that, too. And, you know, the basic question is, is YouTube or Google actually making a, a significant portion of their money from selling advertisements? Or is it, as I've said in the past, in, spec in speculation, mostly, but not really, <laughs> that they're getting, you know, funds from from the state, probably from yeah. DARPA or something like that. Yeah. And know. we know that we know that that was the case in the beginning. And so there's really no reason to believe that that's not continued and that, that that's all it is. So I don't think YouTube would go away whether, you know, even if all the big advertisers left because they want to do this. And an interesting thing to think about too, is I wonder if they saw this coming and if they've been 
you know, hedging their bets or if they've been uh, thinking about what the risks are up until now. Because if the money is important to them at all, which I doubt it is, but let's say that it is, okay, does that mean that all along when they've obviously been allowing all of this Elsagate material to, in, in fact, it seemed to me like, the people at YouTube were are in on uh, censoring people who talk about Elsagate. Yeah, yeah, so seems that way. They're putting they're putting tons of effort into shutting people up about it, and then they're also putting tons of effort into protecting the channels. So, of course, is it because they they want the the content to get out because it's actually part of a conspiracy, or is it just they're making lots of money from those channels? because they're getting high volume of views, even if the views are totally manipulated, which is what I think. Um, yeah, and and maybe, so, maybe worse, right? Not just high volume of views, maybe that's where the market is, God forbid. Well, they, they auto-roll those Elsa Gate things. I mean, I, I know I know people where they they let their kids watch YouTube and they put on some, some kid content that they know, and then they leave the room for... 45 minutes and come back and the Elsa Gate stuff is playing. Yes. I mean, it's... That's what yeah, that... They just roll it right in. I warned people They're, when I found it of that. Like, watch what you're doing. Pay closer attention if you have small children. That's one of the few times I've stepped out to the normies and been like, look, there's stuff that, that I'm looking at that you absolutely need to know about because you have small children. And you mm -hmm. don't want to start with Spider-Man... Yeah. And end up with Spider Man and Elsa or trying to have a It's a not ball, by accident. A ball pit baby. You know, I saw some really weird stuff. It's not by accident either. I mean no. there's they, they No, yeah, it's doing. it's like you can tell that the robots have gone in there and, and decided, Oh, if you like this, you'll probably like this. If you like this actual cartoon that exists on T V, then you might like this spoof of it that has a bunch of weird and dirty yeah. stuff in it some Foucault-esque degeneracy in it well, <laughs> I, I made a, a conspiracy and conspiracy theory hashtags when I uh, linked this video to uh, Twitter so I wonder if that red flagged us to uh, some sort of a robot that was looking more closely Probably shouldn't have hashtagged con conspiracy. Conspiracy theory. No, we theory. can't do that. We have to but, just do what we planned. You know. We have to do what we planned and say, okay, we're uh, grateful for the reach that your platform has, but our long-term or medium-term plan is to get away from it, or at least get to the point where it's just one little tertiary river off of our mainstream. We which, should simulcast. Yeah, which is ideally, you know, I think. If we could pull it off, what I'd love to see is for us to have a server at Tracy's office or home or whatever and one here so that we've got redundancy, you know, yeah. and maybe they even work back to back so we get a harder push and we can simulcast. But the, the idea is what we're actually physically doing goes into our thing and comes out the other end and from there we control where it goes. You know, that's... Yeah, I... I... No, Carry go on. ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, I have at this point stopped studying most of the SEO techniques and I don't bother putting in tags on anything because I figure like if I put in any tags that are relevant to the content, then I'm going to get censored. If yeah. I put in other tags, yeah, they might myself. not be irrelevant, you know? Yeah, yeah, instead of getting benefit, you're flagging yourself. Maybe we should come up with some code words for our conspiracy sort of topics. You know, like uh, some sort of uh, shorthand that we all kind of know. Yeah, like I wish it was Wednesday. I wish it was Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish it Wednesday now officially means anti Foucaultist. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. can tell just by the irritation of my voice. Like, if you guys want to play the game that it's words, we'll all just. Ad hoc, any of us that have a vocabulary will ad hoc make up words that go around your stupid shit. Yeah. You know? We'll just call it well, Foucaultology. <laughs> Foucaultology. You can fuck off. You can fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I think, you know, we have to just 
yeah, build a loyal audience and use all the old time-tested techniques for, uh, you know, maintaining and growing that audience. Because every time you try to follow the crowd and figure out what the thing is to do now, you're just playing along yeah. and you're, I, I always end up, you know, putting so much time into it that by the time I finally feel like I figured it out and I'm ready to apply these techniques, oh, the algorithm changes or they start censoring things like yeah. that or you know, yes. something changes. So. That's why I stopped studying SEO a long time ago because I realized like, okay, I've got this huge like dictionary sized book and you're going through it you're learning and trying to memorize at least a few techniques what's seo mean S uh, search engine optimization oh. and so by the time you've uh, started to learn and apply it's already changed and that was years ago when i stopped looking at it so now i can only imagine how impossible it is to be an seo expert yeah it's worse than trying to follow medicare it's like cracking the enigma codes medicare the enigma machine change code. their guidelines on us every six weeks and i mean that medicare would rewrite their guidelines and modify and change them for getting paid for whatever medical equipment we would be supplying every six weeks We'd, be, we'd have to get on conference calls and memorize it all and take notes and reference new pdfs and printouts and and so it's the same you know it's just this uh bureaucratic bullshit just doesn't work tracy you're right old-fashioned advertising hasn't changed since the days of uh you know there's a book <coughs> called scientific advertising i recommend it to anybody that's that needs to to understand how ads are made and how people write copy I'm trying to think of the man's name but even if the internet became really strict with a, a hard a hard mailing list and postcards we could still let people know that we're broadcasting or available you know yes i'd love sorry, to I, sorry if i seem distracted i'm trying to figure out what i'm going to read next no that's fine I, i'm kind of doing the same thing i'm trying to i feel like i'm still just cutting in outline and basic ideas and i need to pull the trigger and actually start to add to this thing i'm not unhappy with it but all i've really done is go sharpen up all the lines i don't know how well people can see it but I, now, you know you we can, can see it pretty well you can read an article about um, what we're discussing if you want just because it's timely if you want to read what um disney actually did I'm, the one that somebody posted was on bloomberg ironically enough okay and if you're new to the show, you guys, there's a we have a Discord where we discuss this stuff all the time. Yeah. Uh, there's a link in the chat. See my fasties. Definitely check it out. And like, share, subscribe. Yeah, please like, share, subscribe. Um, I dropped a link for the Discord. I never did see if it was working, so I dropped that link. It might still be here. Let's see what happens if I push the button. Um, if I go... Let's see... Um, I, somebody click on that let me know if it works um, we we love hanging out in the discord it's a total wonderful time suck like if you have things oh, great. that you're supposed to do like uh, clean your house do laundry work at your job call your mom write a letter any things that you're really supposed to do or things that you really want to do like what we're doing tonight if you come to the discord and hang out with us all of that will be procrastinated like the whole week a whole day no problem it just flies away yeah. you know next thing you know you're nodding out with your smartphone in bed and then it's hey, tomorrow and you're yeah. getting messages from the discord it's great <laughs> it's awesome there's so much great stuff in there like those uh the star spangled banner with subliminal messages yesterday i was watching that. oh yeah that yeah awesome. yeah the, um well the the there's a terrific video of that somebody back in the day when video editing was more of an art than it is now. Well, I just say that uh, it was harder is what I mean, you know. It's easier to edit now than it was back when this was edited. Someone took Ronald and Nancy Reagan and hashed them up so that instead of promoting Nancy's Just Say No to Drugs campaign, they are absolutely encouraging you to take drugs and telling you how wonderful the drugs that they've been taking are. And it's really funny. And then alongside of that, somebody posted, um, I don't know, uh, I don't know how many of you remember that, uh, for one thing, TV stations used to go 
off of the air. It looks like uh, Snake Jones is bailing. Good night, Snake. Um, they used to go off the air at night, like midnight, right? Yeah. About midnight. Two o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. It's midnight, sometimes later, and they would uh, play the Star Spangled Banner with the flag waving and sometimes with jets flying by, and then, you know, that would be the end of broadcasting until the next morning. And uh, I think it was uh, Jacob Bacchus posted this. Um, it, like, shows you that there's subliminal messaging hidden in the lyrics for the national anthem and it was absolutely spooky and weird that video was yeah. just disturbing it was like the, the the letters for the for the words of the song would come out but it was it was sort of like uh wheel of fortune or something you know how like they spin the, the letters yeah. around like a letter would come out and then it would spin around to the correct letter for the lyrics of the song but it it had all these messages like obey uh, consume. Yeah, was, God uh, loves you, and He also loves it when we bomb Iran and stuff like that. It was a uh, pretty interesting, and a real thing, you know, from the '60s. Yeah, yeah, it was, and then, then I noticed that uh, Harrison had commented, I think, on that video that yeah, that's how they used to have to do it, but now the technology is so advanced. It might have been Jacob that said it, that you know, now they just hypnotize you with frame rate or uh, strobe rate on your TV. And if you've never looked up the patents, there's patents you can find that show you that your television and your, your flat screen television and your computer monitor are absolutely being utilized to affect your behavior by the strobe rate and the, you know, the flashing color sounds and images can be attuned to your neurological system and absolutely hypnotize and affect you. Yeah. You know? I've seen it happen. I, I was at a it, walked into a pizza restaurant the other day, and there there was a TV on, and I saw I saw a guy walk in. He he was talking to his friends. He was animated, and there was a TV on on the side, and he like noticed it out of the corner of his eye, and, he, and his head turned, and his eyes just glazed over. And it was like it was like a switch, like this guy like totally just stopped, like dead in his tracks and his friends kept walking to go order their 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 pizza and he was just standing there with this hypnotized look it was like he got zapped zapped like yeah. activated into a hypnotic uh, brain wave you know from alpha alpha to theta state or something that's just crazy man so i found the article awesome okay it is kind of amazing the, the quote that they have from disney okay Walt Disney Co. is said to have pulled its advertising spending from YouTube, joining other companies, including Nestle, after a blogger, wow, after a blogger detailed how comments on Google's video site were being used to facilitate a, quote, soft core pedophilia ring. What? Soft core pedophilia? Oh, my God. Yeah. Which, it's, it's interesting. Okay, I don't even know who the blogger is. Um, and that quote is slightly inaccurate only because it's not soft core. What I saw, they're actually advertising quite a lot of it. The codes indicate that the victims will be physically hurt. And in some cases that they will die, you know, that that's, I mean, you don't see that in the video you see in the comments, the codes. And that's what they're indicating. So the video is slightly, you know, kids being traumatized, and the video is traumatizing to especially kids watching it. But that's just an advertisement, and the comments have the codes in them, and the video description will have the codes in it that indicate that what they're really selling is a certain type of something, right? And a lot of it, the codes were indicating you know, that, yeah, that, that someone's going to get hurt or killed. So this isn't, <laughs> there may be soft core pedophilia themes in the videos, but what they're actually advertising, the, the pedophilia ring that is being facilitated here is not soft core. This is like the real snuff. And uh, yeah, that, well, anyway, so I'll continue to read this article. Um, it's pretty amazing that that it's finally coming out. Like, I don't know if they just, it's impossible that they just noticed this, but it's gotta be like with Bill Cosby, when that one guy made a joke about Bill Cosby, all of a sudden 
everybody who already knew about it couldn't ignore the yeah. truth of it anymore. Tipping point. That's what I was saying. That it's definitely some kind of a tipping point. Some of the videos involved ran next to ads placed by Disney and Nestle. All Nestle companies in the U.S. have paused advertising on YouTube, a spokeswoman for the company said Wednesday in an email. Video game maker Epic Games Inc. and German packaged food giant Dr. August Wait Uder KG also said that they had postponed YouTube spending after their ads were shown to play before the videos. Disney had also withheld its spending, according to people with knowledge of the matter, who asked not to be identified because of the, deci the decision hasn't been made public. On Sunday, Matt Watson, okay, here we go. Matt Watson, a video blogger, posted a 20-minute clip detailing how comments on YouTube were used to identify certain videos in which young girls were in activities that could be construed as sexually suggestive, such as posing in front of a mirror and doing gymnastics. Watson's video demonstrated how if users clicked on one of the videos, YouTube's algorithms recommended similar ones. By Wednesday, Watson's video had been viewed more than 1.7 million times. So again, the algorithms are smart enough to snip out some comment about Michelle Foucault or whatever. The, obviously they know what these videos are and they're intentionally recommending them. Yeah, I'm so, sure they're getting shit. Could you imagine the complaints of the average soccer mom or especially the uh, blue-collar dad? You know, you're trying to make dinner, you're trying to hurry up and shovel the walk, you put your kids in front of the YouTube and you come back in and it's this horrible Elsa Spider-Man uh, weirdo porn shit. You know, lots of people are trying to get a hold of these guys and tell them not just like, geez, that seems kind of funny, but like, we're going to call our lawyers, you know? What are you doing? Yeah, i got to imagine they're getting lots of complaints. And, you know, if you flag someone's video for some political reason, I think it goes down almost instantly, you know? Yeah. So this is amazing that they're just being forced to deal with it. But, yeah, yeah. I, I talked to um, Jim after one of the shows just a few weeks ago, and I mentioned to him, hey, you know, I didn't go looking for this again because it had gotten me in trouble before this last summer, accidentally finding this stuff and discovering how real it really is and the stuff that they're really talking about. But I had accidentally uh, clicked on a video that happened to have many, several X's in a row as the title of the video. So then that put in something uh, you know, it recommended something with a similar keyword in the, you know, on the panel on the right of my computer. And it was all like little girls with horses and they didn't show the, you know, any contact between the girls and the horses, but the horses were all having sex in the pictures. And so, you know, I just was like, I guess the second of, curiosity happened before my senses got to me and I was like what the hell is that I click on it and it opened up a whole world and it was a world of stuff that's on YouTube that um, the thumbnail for the picture makes it pretty clear what's what the content is the titles however are misleading but they still have the keywords in there like you know it's, it's that it's about a girl that loves horses but when you look at the picture, I mean, you know what it's really about. So That's there's no crazy. way that they don't have robots that can tell exactly what those videos are about and what they're what they're facilitating. Yeah, and and they're they're dealing with this Elsa Gate stuff now, but you know they've got other uh, avenues to get this same content out. It's just recoded in some new way or maybe something yeah everybody's being driven to a new link absolutely yeah and that's kind of what tracy originally described too was that the real business that's why i said the real business is going on in the comments section of uh what the what little minor code you know what kind of cheese pizza people are trying to order and um i remember back in the day you know internet 1.0 you had to be really careful with google and other search engines you know, if you type teen lollipop sales, you're not going to get uh, candy and girls with pigtails. You would have got horrible, horrible pornographic results. Because 
me and my friends would do that sometimes, you know, we'd be like searching and searching for stuff on the internet back in the day, like, you know, 95, 97, and uh, you'd be clicking the back button real fast on some stuff. So it's always there on the internet right under the, the surface. The joke that it's all pornography and cat videos. Rule 34, is that what it is? Yeah, rule 34 is, you know, if there's, if you can think of something, there's pornography of it on the internet, and um, it's, it's true, but they've, they've found a way... In my opinion, they found a way to make the internet pretty damn slick and safe for the average people trying to look for stuff that aren't perverted or sexually completely off the hook. But all that stuff is still definitely lingering around because when people have proclivities and they don't, they're not checking them, they're not trying to manage them, they're trying to encourage them, it's a market. It's just like cocaine or heroin or anything else. It's a market. People, you know, it's disgusting and horrible but people are gonna seek out what drives their passion yeah uh I, okay so i don't know who o1 is um but i i think that this comment that he or she made it's you have to, you have to know more about elsa gate because it's not what uh he's saying he or she says elsa gate is just the hardcore version of what Softcore mainstream cartoons have been doing for decades. Ren and Stimpy was filled with trauma and fetish content. So are most modern cartoons. I understand what you're saying. But that's This stuff is something else entirely. It so is, you just, is, you just right? have to watch a few hours of it <laughs> and you'll get it. Or not actually just a few minutes. But No, it's true. I mean, we, we totally understand that point. I understand what you're saying, but um, the... The, it's not even it's not even trying to be entertaining. It's like just dropping no, code words. It's it's advertising. Yeah. It's, it's not brainwashing or predictive programming or uh, you know, slow over a long period of time degeneracy aimed at kids. It's coded advertising. Yeah, yeah. There, it's but, it's a, a very specific thing that has never existed before until YouTube. Yeah. So. So how's the art coming, guys? Uh, I'd say it's coming good. Jim's little sculpture looks uh, wonderful. I'm finally starting to add color instead of just black and white. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I'm probably kind of, kind of slowing down because uh, all that uh, YouTube censorship stuff. Yeah, my mind's kind of blown. Got, my, blown. got I would, my goat. Yeah, I would say the the events happening in the chat combined with what we learned in the news today from. Disney, I am curious to hear more of this article if you're interested to read it. Yeah, I'll finish the article, and then, yeah, I was going to say I should probably at most read one more thing, and then I'll, I'll have to wrap it up. Yeah, that that's that's cool. Yeah, yeah, heck, we're already at almost 11 o'clock. I didn't even think Time flies that, so. when you're having fun. Yeah. Then when you're a half hour late. <laughs> <laughs> as much my fault as, as yours. No, no, no. It's nobody's fault. Three-hour sound check. All right, so uh, his video was viewed more than 1.7 million times, the blogger. Any con this is a quote. Any content, including comments, that endangers minors is abhorrent, and we have clear policies prohibiting this on YouTube. We took immediate action <laughs> by deleting accounts and channels, reporting illegal activity to authorities, and disabling violative comments, a spokeswoman for YouTube said in an email. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet they just mainly disabled all the people that were noticing it. Yeah. Today, total ad spending on the videos mentioned was less than 8000 within the last 60 days. And YouTube plans refunds, the spokeswoman said. Oh, wow. See, you see where this could go. Okay, so right now they're going to give $8,000 worth of refunds t because of a handful of videos that were specifically identified. Well, imagine when, you know, everybody starts identifying all of the videos and tagging all of the advertisers and saying, hey, your, your video, your ad showed in front of this video and look what it is. Because we know, we who have looked into this, there's, we know there's hundreds and thousands of these things. Yeah. Uh, different videos getting millions of views, supposedly, which are, I, I have no doubt, uh, manipulated by robots. But still, they're bilking all of these advertisers. They're using YouTube. YouTube's allowing them to do this. Imagine the amount of refunds they would have to give if it really 
snowballed, which I don't see what should stop it. Uh, you know, that it would be so great. If yeah, I agree. They just had like this gigantic refund that they had to give and it would never, there's no ending to it because you could go back for years and say, oh, I want my money back for that too. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. go ahead. It, make, no, it makes me wonder if this isn't all intentional because like, any, anytime that our gut reaction is, yeah, it makes me think, crap, we're probably being had. You know, like... Uh, I, Limited hangout. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Limited, and it's always two or three things that they have going on. It's never like, oh, they did this and the outcome was that. They don't ever. It's always two prong, three prong attack, layers of intention with a short, medium, and long term plan. Yeah. You know, and so it makes me think. And this, to me, this all goes side side by side with the QAnon stuff too. So if they hammer it all down, say that it has to be censorship because. We're finally arresting all the bad guys, and we have to knock all of the bad content off the internet, or we'll have to shut it down. So if you want an internet at all, be happy with what we give you, because otherwise there's so many bad people behind the scenes doing bad things to children and otherwise that we have to shut this whole thing down, you know. But don't worry, we're filling up uh, Guantanamo Bay with the Obamas and the Clintons. We yeah. can't show you any pictures or video, but trust the plan. You know, where we go, one we go all, from darkness to light, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, I, f I feel like any time a leader comes out in the opposition, it's controlled opposition of one, you know, depth or another. Like, they they have both sides. They have a, they have a handle on both sides. Like, even Flat Earth, you know, everything. Yeah. They've, they've, they control the uh, loudest voices. Well, I think that they've already had a limited hangout with Elsa Gate, and I'm not sure if it was intentional, but it's really it, what happened, what has been happening over the last few years with that, ever since that term got coined, um, would probably explain why the one commenter thought that this is just just offensive videos that are traumatizing to children. Yeah. Well, it's because the people who put out reports about Elsagate in the beginning didn't understand that in the comments there's codes and people actually making deals. So they just, they, they knew there was something smelly about it, you know, which is exactly what the reaction was of members in my family, members of my family who rarely believe in or talk about conspiracies, but when they saw these types of videos that long before I heard about Elsa Gate, I experienced it, experienced my kid uh, happening upon these things. And after a while, uh, me and other adults who knew him and witnessed this started to wonder and think, okay, is this a conspiracy? You know, is this somebody trying to mind control and damage our kids somehow? Right. And so that's the extent of the analysis that most Elsagate material is. So, but it's amazing how you could overlook the other stuff that's obviously there, but I overlooked it too for years. And when I was doing this investigation this summer, uh, where I went really deeply into it, I noticed myself, the comments for the first time, I noticed it after I... <laughs> snapped out of a hypnotic trance that I had been in while watching one of the videos, uh, one of the one of these Elsa Gate type cartoons, is I, I noticed something in the comments, you know, out of the corner of my eye, but I was watching the video and I literally heard myself, my inner voice say, that's weird, but that's not important. Wow. And then I just stopped myself. I was like, why did I say that to myself? I'm going to look. And I looked down, and that's when I saw coded comments. And I had just been unearthing the meaning of a lot of these codes. So I finally understood them, too. You know, I knew what they meant. But I have looked at these videos, you know, dozens of times at least, or videos like them, and never looked in the comments for anything. These are not so, the droids you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I wouldn't doubt if that's something similar has happened to every, every person that tried to write about Elsa Gate stuff and tried to figure out why are they doing this. Is The answer was right in front of them, 
but they didn't look. So, well, they just yeah, think I, maybe they don't have the uncanny mind that you have to, you know, especially as a writer. Writers, artists, uh, our internal voice is more defined or more different. And Jim and I talk about this, too, with your, your eye. If you're constantly having to do something that requires uh, your eye, um, then you see everything differently. So not, you know, what you did was catch on that, like, wait, somehow this video is telling me to subconsciously believe something that's right in front of my face isn't really very important and that I should stay focused on the content. Yes. So, you know, how many are you out of a thousand? You're probably only two out of a thousand people that might see it. So everyone else is hypnotized by the video. It might be a video that's bad, boring, or not even important either, but they're stuck in that cycle, whatever the wave form of that video is, along with the color and the sound. It's just... Yeah. It's just nutty. It makes makes me want to run away to the woods, man. <laughs> and, and with leading disinfo, you get you get presented with a with a path to take that isn't, you know, it's an easy path. Like like oh well, Pizzagate is only uh, just a a pizza restaurant that that also sells children, but it's much more than that. You know, it's yeah yeah. The... I'm amazed at uh, how successfully the Pizzagate in, uh, information has gotten out so that there's a lot of people that don't go around talking about it very much. Yeah. But they know about it, and every now and then it slips in. And, and they've had a very reasoned analysis of it. They just don't go around talking about it. But, you know, they're aware that there's some fake stuff slipped in and some things that aren't a big deal that some people uh, obsess on. But they're also aware of the general gist of the information that came out. And I would say, like, remember, okay, in the beginning, there was there, the argument, is Pizzagate real or not? Yeah. Well, at this point, enough information has come out that is verifiable that it's not really necessary to examine every single aspect of the initial famous incident because what has come from all of this is that we're now aware of and know what to look for. We're, we're, it's like, you know, it's a whole other dimension of reality that, uh, that people didn't know to look for before, but now they do. And, you know, now they know a lot more about how politics operates and how people are kept in line and why. Yeah, it's not, so, is it real? It's to what degree are we tracking something relative to it today and who is not involved yeah and that's a big difference you know because folks like us i mean jim and i've talked about that we i mean i read the franklin cover-up it was a long time ago man yeah. i remember listening to john decamp being interviewed uh by alex jones and talking about um the main guy whatever his name was the the black guy who was a republican like he had a contractor on there talking about having like a little limited hangout, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and that's way, way back. So it's taken this many years to where, like, now what Tracy's saying is true. There is such a thing as a silent majority. They are a lot more well informed than you imagine. People who are quote unquote right wing aren't as stupid as they try to make Trump supporters look. People who are quote unquote left wing are not just purple haired uh, Nazi feminist women screaming topless in the streets. These are facades. This is, this is a, a caricature of bullshit that they're trying to get you to identify and discount. Identify and discount. Identify and discount. You know, America's still here, folks. We're all still here. We're all pretty much the same as we've always been. Except we're getting bombarded more than we ever have in the past. And, um... Well said. You know, that's... Yes. The... The fact that it's all coming out, that's... I wish there was some way to get our fingers on the pulse of what's... What really is what they call deep state psyop. Mm -hmm. And what really is... The edge, what I want to know is where's the, where's the spigot of information uh, spraying and how, which, which spigots are the ones that they really are concerned about? <laughs> I mean, and I think, well, I mean, I say that actually here right now, what we're all doing as a group right now, we're closer to an answer to that question than most people because we know for sure if we completely uh, interrogate Tracy right now as to exactly what got her into hot water, 
um, we'll find out how close we are to the spigot and we don't want to know you know that's uh, and that's I found that to be true way back in the day uh, that's why I quit I quit studying conspiracy stuff for four or five years for a similar reason now I didn't have anything personal happen but there's thousands of stories if you go search targeted individuals and all of this stuff lots and lots of people are trying to go after hardcore truth and I would say this, folks, that if you want to avoid getting in any trouble by searching for the truth, avoid current event type stuff. Don't go um, trying to use your keyboard and your monitor to accidentally uh, confront people who are involved in really high-level heinous crime. Of course, if you do that successfully, you may not come out the other end of it very well. They'll financially and uh, reputation-wise ruin you and or worse. And if you go looking around, there's Info a lot of... Info jail. Yeah, there's lots of people that are in that situation, you know. That'll fuck you up. And people that know... You said it, Tracy, the other day that... Um, that it's like getting shit smeared on you. If you go, if I go down to the Wall Walla Police Department and rush in and be like, I've got dirt on the whole bunch of high-level pedophiles here locally, um, it's not going to be what you think where they're like, sweet, get six more cops yeah. and we'll go kick in their door. Or they'll be like, whoa, buddy, let's get like, you in a private room and step on into this tape. room. That's yeah. right. You know, it's not, um, you know, and, and for the record, I'm being facetious. I don't know anything like that going on in Walla Walla, and I don't care to because I'm not equipped to do anything about it. I'm like anyone else. I hate it. I'd love to see it end. It makes me curious to see what's going to happen next if Disney's pulling their money and now comments are getting shadow banned, you know. And if you've, you know, I follow enough little uh, Twitter accounts and stuff on the QAnon stuff that they are still acting as if things are ramping up and they're still tossing a dog a bone on evidence i haven't seen any evidence that makes me go oh wow that's crazy you know like no significant name no significant thing but enough that it's still the slow turning of the dial up you know they're turning the heat and the water up the hot water the water's getting hotter we're getting closer to something either actually boiling or certainly being made to look through illusion as if it's boiling you know <laughs> Yeah. Hey, um, I've got a passage here from The Secret of the Golden Flower. Certainly. I, it's Sounds, like a, a page and a good. half, and then, then I'm going to say goodnight. Yep. Yeah. All right. A magic spell for the far journey. Master Lu Tzu said, Yu Ching has left behind him a magic spell for the far journey. Four words crystallize the spirit in the space of energy. In the sixth month, white snow is suddenly seen to fly. At the third watch, the sun's disk sends out blinding rays. In the water blows the wind of the gentle. Wandering in heaven, one eats the spirit energy of the receptive and the still, deep, the still deeper secret of the secret. The land that is nowhere, that is the true home. These verses are full of mystery. The meaning is, the most important things in the great Tao are the words action through non-action. Non-action prevents a man from becoming entangled in form and image materiality. Action in non-action prevents a man from sinking into numbing emptiness and dead nothingness. The effect depends entirely on the central one. The releasing of the effect is in the two eyes. The two eyes are like the pole of the great wane, which turns the whole of creation. They cause the poles of light and darkness to circulate. The elixir depends from beginning to end on one thing, the metal in the midst of the water, that is, the lead in the water region. Heretofore, we have spoken of the circulation of the light, indicating thereby the initial release which works from without upon that which lies within. This is to aid one in obtaining the master. It is for pupils in the beginning stages. They go through the two lower transitions in order to gain the upper one. After the sequence of events is clear and the nature of the release is known, heaven no longer withholds the way, but reveals the ultimate truth. Disciples, keep it secret and redouble your effort. And that's all I'm gonna read. Wow. Yeah, that's the Gnosis, folks. Thank you very much, Tracy. And yeah, we're saying you gotta go. Um, thank you for- Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for coming and I think, uh, Maybe we'll stand here and work just a little bit longer, and we're probably going to have to call it, too. We're getting to over past 11. I don't know. You want to close on a somber note and call this a, a night, Jim? 
I think we could close out. I think we will. Uh, not done, but I, I could reveal my uh, work here. Yeah. Here, let me... You want me to take it? or you, No, here. You step over here. Oh wow! Wow! It's not, it's not done yet. You did yet. all that now? Yeah, just just a few minutes ago. <laughs> Jim's a professional sculptor. If you really want something done, it's really you know, rough. If you have money, we uh, we can we can get it done. Oh man, that's so great! Can you can you bring it a little bit closer to the camera? It's it's still rough, mind you. I, oh I kind man, of, I love uh, it. Ran out of steam after we got shadow banning issues. But yeah, well, I, that's just what they wanted. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it doesn't really work, though, if we're all here as a group. And um, a few of the random people that uh, I've gotten closer to, obviously I started with someone like Tracy. Um, I'm perfectly happy to give out. If I trust you and think you're a legit, above-board person, you've got evidence of you being a real person online, I'm glad to give you my email address, my telephone number, and in some cases even my home address, and I encourage everyone to do that. So if they change this up, that we can stay in touch, man. You yeah. know, if we stay in touch, even just for the goodness of the feeling of having other people in the world that understand, think, and feel something similar to you do, or at least can have conversation, it's important. It's important to have a real community community that's not communitarian. And if it is communitarian, it's our own definition of it, and not the one they're trying to feed us. You know, so hey, yeah, Dan, we're all trying to build a, the the right way here. You know, a, a community in a place where we got nothing to hide, and we're making things right. Yeah, grow okay, a garden. You know? Make sure you know grow how to garden. get clean water. And, and you know, don't watch too much YouTube, and certainly don't let your kids sit around watching it by themselves for too long. You know, I, I hate to end on a somber note, but I think we're going to give it an okay bye and call it, call it good. Um, we look forward to seeing you guys over in the Discord. Um, if you didn't yes, get a link, yes. just hit us up on... Uh, I'll, I'll drop a permanent link later when I modify the comments. I mean, the, uh, the, you know, the expanded information. And um, please, uh, there's also links in there to uh, donate to us. If you want to see this art pushed forward to something that's post-production and reproduction, uh, go ahead and contact us. Send us a few dollars. Let us know. Of course, there's also links for Amazon to buy any or all of Tracy's books. That's why uh, we're here with Tracy, because we were such obsessed fans that we chased her down, and she liked what we were doing and joined us, and uh, we, we love it. And so, um, and of course, uh, you know, I don't know how long she's going to keep her discount for uh for plus ultra membership yeah, it's worth it way it's worth totally it. worth it there's a it's an enormous amount of content that tracy generates behind the scenes and um so so we look forward to seeing you on the discord we look forward to seeing you on the back side of plus ultra if you choose to join it's 50 dollars right now especially if you use the paypal and um i think i think we have to call that uh call that number 40 ladies and gentlemen hey. Yeah, go ahead, Can I Tracy. Say, um, I have responded to zero emails from fans this week. And so if you were left out, you were not the only one. I will respond next week. I'm going to catch up on everything. Okay, so yeah, That's Tracy's going to gonna hop on the email train. I assume you get a lot of email, Tracy. <laughs> I get some, and it just I it, it piles up because I just have so many um, you know things that I need to be doing, so... That's all. I just wanted to let people know that I'm not ignoring you because I don't care. I will be responding soon. Oh, good. Awesome. All right. We're going to give everybody that. a big, uh, I got you. my mouse over the stop stream button. This is where you say, okay, bye. See you next week. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. Okay, everybody. bye.